Amherst Media, are you ready? Um, seeing that we have a quorum of the full town council, I call the meeting of the Committee of the Whole or the Town Council to order at 2 o'clock. And in just a moment, I'm going to have them introduce themselves. Um, but I'm waiting for... Ah, we don't need to introduce ourselves. We're going to have our name tags. And I'm going to call it, since this is also a meeting of the Finance Committee and principally a meeting of the Finance Committee, I'm calling the Finance Committee to order at the same time. We do have a quorum of both present. So... Hi. So I'd like to welcome everybody and thank you for... Thank everybody for being here. Um, the Finance Committee agenda, which is also the agenda, therefore, the Committee of the Whole, consists of the following items. Community Preservation Act proposal, capital plan, budget updates, if any. We always put that in there, and I don't anticipate that there will be any. Public comment, minutes of previous meetings, and matters not anticipated. The way that we're going to structure the meeting is that um, we're going to begin with Community Preservation Act proposal and then do capital plan. I think that those are the two principal things for today. I don't think that there's going to be um, time that needs to be allocated for either. Initially, I'm going to keep an eye on it and see if we can do the Community Preservation Act proposal in one hour. Uh, though if we may have to go over a few minutes, we'll see how that goes. Um, as far as public comment, what I'm going to do um, is divide it into actually three sections of public comment. So um, at some point during the discussion of the Community Preservation Act proposal, we will um, do public comments solely on um, that matter. Uh, when we do the, uh, discuss the capital plan, again, um, I will call for public comment at some point, appropriate point, and it will be public comments regarding the capital plan. And then the third section is if there are public comments about other matters that are not related to those two topics, um, they will be welcome, but we will handle that as the third section of public comment. So I just wanted to clarify that aspect of it. And um, so the Community Preservation Act proposal was presented um, uh, to the um, entire council and to the Finance Committee and is available um, on the town website um, through the um, page on budget matters. And um, I don't know if Sonia has a couple of copies available or not, but um, if anybody doesn't have one, there might be a few copies available on paper. Um, so with that, um, I'm going to ask Nate Bunnington and, I, our, and Anthony Delaney uh, from staff to come forward to make the presentation. Um, I think that there's a, one other matter that I just want to make, uh, to, to say at the beginning of the meeting so that nobody has any undue expectations. Um, the Finance Committee will not be voting today on any of the matters that we're hearing about. This is a meeting in which we are receiving information in order to inform us about uh, the uh, Community Preservation Act and capital proposals, but the Finance Committee may seek additional information and take um, before it uh, makes a decision at a future meeting. With that, let me just ask the President if she has any other uh, thing that she wants to say as an introductory matter. Thank you. 
If not, then I'll turn it over to uh, Nate, and I guess that you have a different, another member of the committee sitting with you now. Uh, thanks. I'm Nate Buddington. I'm chair of the CPA, joined uh, by uh, Jim Oldham, who's the vice chair. And I want to thank you for reviewing our proposals, taking a look at them. We had uh, proposals originally that well exceeded our budget, so we had to make some pretty tough calls. Um, but we were, I think, uh, pr pretty, pretty vigilant in um, looking at the degree to which these proposals served the broad swath of our population um, and were financially responsible. So um, let me just go, if you'd like, I can go through them one by one and see if you, if you have questions. Would that be helpful? Uh, yes. Uh, what, well, what might be helpful is uh, in order to group them so we don't break it up too much. Okay. But, for example, if you're going to do open space first, I will look to the council, uh, not just to members of the Finance Committee, but to the council for questions that they may have. Okay. So we have a, a, a couple of proposals for open space, and recreation is folded into open space. Um, we, the first one we had was a proposal that was originally a, a $50,000 proposal. We awarded $10,000, and this was for the conservation land improvements and rehabilitation. Um, we are able, by the um, structure of this CPA, to uh, provide maintenance to CPA funded properties. So we, uh, the, the, the town was interested in restoring uh, bridges, trails. We have a lot of infrastructure problems on CPA funded town land, on all town land. Um, we did not have a full $50,000 to award to this, but the, the, the town was comfortable with a, with a $10,000 um, award to start repairing some of the infrastructure in our CPA funded properties. So that was a, a, a $10,000 fund for these improvements. Uh, some of the land purchases that we had this year, um, one was the Zala property. This is a $188,000 award. Um, and, uh, do we? Yeah, there we go. So. This is at the intersection of Sunderland Road and 116. Uh, there are already two protected parcels. You can see in the green, um, in the north and the south. Uh, these are some, uh, there's a stream, as you can see, running through the entirety of the property. This is a lot of really interesting wetlands. Uh, we've had moose in this territory. It's a really important habitat. To the west is what uh, in the Hadley parcel is, I think, the largest um, agricultural preserved or restricted land in Hadley. So if you look at the entirety of this piece, uh, Amherst and Hadley, uh, this is a sizable piece of property. The, the place in the middle, you can see that's uh, in, in the grid, um, is a way to uh, allow for trail access from the north and the south and to uh, make this a whole piece of property. There is, on the sort of east side of this, some room for possible community garden. Uh, there's a small barn that you can see. Um, that's the original uh, family barn. The family house of this property was taken down when Route 116 was constructed many years ago. It's about 25 acres. Uh, Hickory Ridge, this is, as you know, is the old Hickory Ridge golf course. Uh, this is um, a pretty remarkable piece of land. It sits between two of the most heavily populated, uh, densely populated parts of the town, uh, as you can see, north and south of there. There will be two, the, the, the plan is for CPA to purchase, to be part of the purchase of this land, and it will be to purchase land that is largely in the stream bed and in other areas that are not really developable. The area on, that borders West Pomeroy where the parking lot and the clubhouse is and a little bit uh, west of the clubhouse uh, will be purchased with capital funds, meaning that that land can be used for repurposing the clubhouse for potentially affordable housing. It will not have the same conservation restrictions 
as the parcel it's purchased with CPA funds. In the sort of uh, northwest corner and north central parcel, there'll be two, I think, 12 acre solar sites. Um, we're excited about this property uh, because, partly because it has pretty spectacular views of the Holyoke Range, partly because it sits between two very densely populated parts of town, uh, and it also, because it was a golf course, it has an existing infrastructure that will make it almost instantly uh, pretty handicap friendly with the paths and the bridges. And that is a um, $200,000 uh, CPA investment. Uh, the Keat Haskins property is another pretty interesting piece of land. This is in uh, the area around Cushman Brook that is, uh, I guess, north east of uh, the bridge that goes over the river there just above Cushman. You can see in the, 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 the dark green areas are, are existing protected areas. Uh, Shootsbury has protected a big piece of their property in Cushman Brook. Up, you can see up there in the upper right hand corner. The middle of this map where there's the green grid is the land that uh, we're proposed that we're helping to fund purchase. This <coughs> land, most of it slopes into Cushman Brook. So this is a pretty delicate environment leading right into the brook. Um, you can see two sort of access parcels that hit Market Hill Road. These are for possible um, roads or driveways into this piece of property. And when, when this is completed, if this purchase happens, we'll have almost a full two-mile riverbed of protected land in Cushman Brook from uh, Leverett Road all the way up well into Shootsbury. And that is a uh, 238 thousand dollar investment. We have a couple of recreation proposals. One is for uh, the uh, improvements to the Groff Park um, playground and water park. Uh, we've had a couple of years of uh, CPA investments in this and, and it went a little over budget. Uh, there was a, a, a grant that didn't come through. So we've been kind of going back and forth with the town trying to make this happen because this is probably the least improved park in town, serves uh, a pretty important population in town, and we really wanted to make this investment to make the town's first spray park and to improve uh, some of the other facilities uh, to improve the playground and to make it uh, fully accessible. This, uh, the, um, $110,000 is really um, is money that may be coming back to us. This is really a contingency fund to make sure we don't have to come back for more funds. So depending on how the bids and the construction goes, uh, there's a very good chance that some of this money may come back to us. But we just want to make sure we don't run into another situation where, yet again, um, we have to come back and find more money. And finally, in recreation, uh, the Mill River Recreation Area uh, $25,000 award is to begin to come up with a plan for really, I guess you could just call the completion of the improvements done to Mill River. We, we had a proposal a year ago to redo the basketball court uh, there, which is in the most heavily used basketball court for adults in town. It's in terrible condition and it really needs to be replaced. But a, a couple of things occurred. Uh, one is that the, the, the playground uh, at Mill River is not accessible to the handicapped, and it's in a terrible location in relation to the baseball fields. There are uh, uh, pop-ups that, uh, you know, go 40 feet in the air and land on the playground, and that's just not really sustainable with very young children playing in the playground. So the thinking is that we would, to some extent, go back to the drawing board and come up with a plan to move the playground to reposition the basketball court, uh, potentially to improve the pavilion so that this park really works as a whole and uh, gets the playground in a safer area, moves and improves and expands the basketball court uh, to uh, an area that's just north of the swimming pavilion uh, and adding a, a half or a quarter court, half court, I guess, with a lower basket for young kids. That's a $25,000 proposal. So those are our open space and 
recreation proposals. Thank you. So I guess I'll turn to the council as a whole, and if there are any questions about um, any of the open space or recreation proposals, uh, a lot of few minutes for it. Um, Kathy. Hi, um, I'm Kathy. Hi. Um, I have uh, questions on a couple, and also just an understanding how uh, CPA money works. On the Sal's up property, up off 116, actually drove up there today because I live in far north. Amherst and said, oh, trails, didn't know about those. Because um, they, they enter right off 116. Um, so it's sort of a question of how much that's used. And if we add this piece of land, is the vision is it will be more usable in terms of recreation. So that's one question. And then in the proposal, it said it could potentially be used for community, community plots of farmland. Um, you know, local land, and you know, I think of in New York City, big apartment buildings that don't have any land or housing complexes. Is the vision maybe, you know, someone would get their own piece of land? So, sort of, sort of the use value of the purchase is the big question. Then it had one note that on 116, a piece is potentially developable. You know, that you could have property there. Right. If, if something like that happened, would it be subdivided off and it would become a house or something? So it's, it's a question just about that piece. Yeah, I believe that there's room in there for three houses, uh, roughly three houses. It does begin to get a little wetter as you move to the, uh, I guess, the west. Um, I don't know, is David, do you want to speak to that? Hello, Dave Zomak, uh, Assistant Town Manager, Director of Conservation and Development. I'll see if I can go through those questions. So um, what's really key about, first off, about this parcel is that um, it's identified in the open space and recreation plan as a priority. Everything west, the land west of Route 116, historically has been thought of as, as a high priority for agricultural preservation as well as habitat preservation. And as Nate said, uh, this is right between two already preserved pieces of land. Um, there are, we do everything by appraisal. So this appraised out, the, the value that you see before you is the appraised value based on two to three house lots. Um, those would be difficult to develop, but possible to develop. It all would be based on a curb cut and, and it's, a, it's an odd place to have a house if you went out there. Um, we are trying to develop, I'm working with Stephanie Ciccarello, our sustainability uh, coordinator, director, to um, develop opportunities for people to garden in different ways in all parts of town. And we don't have one in North Amherst. So this would be a very logical place to put community gardens, sharing gardens, anything like that. Um, so that was the proposal. Was there another question I might have missed in there? Um, I didn't have another question on that property. I have yeah, a question, a couple others, so maybe someone else yeah. wants to come in. Um, you know. Let's see if there's anything else on the Zala property before we go on to anything else. Just So uh, did you have one, uh, Mandy? I guess I just have a statement for the Finance Committee, since I'm not on it when you guys start deliberating. You know, if, if it's possible, it seems like this is very low developable, two to three house lots that might not affect the rest of it. So I'd ask that you consider the cost of not buying it and the, uh, you know, like just all of that pro cons on that sense as you're looking at the, the recommendation for the purchase of the land versus it remaining in private hands that might get developed two houses. We need housing in this town, but wouldn't necessarily destroy the environment around that. Mm -hmm. Mr. Zonek, do you have any response on that? Or I... So I guess my response would be that um, going back to everything west of 116 has been a priority per, for preservation. So although, so every piece of land that we propose in Amherst to preserve, we also take a look at the opportunity for limited development. From a planning standpoint, putting two or three isolated houses across the street 
at this very dangerous intersection in the middle of nowhere with no water, no sewer, doesn't really make good planning sense. So there's a lot that goes into our decision to say, we should maybe look at this, this, this whole parcel and not just part of it. As Nate also indicated, it doesn't show on this map, but this is part of a much larger preservation effort in Hadley. So in order to make the deal in Hadley happen, we, Amherst, has offered to participate with Hadley and the Kestrel Trust. So the parcel actually extends three times as large in Hadley, uh, Nate or uh, who's ever controlling that uh, can show. There's uh, about 190 acres total in the whole project. So yeah, it's all of that land. Um, I recall 25 years ago sitting in Mr. Zala's, uh, uh, Tony Zala's uh, living room trying to convince him to preserve this land. Uh, he has since passed away and his brother Ray is now in charge of the property. So we're now dealing with another generation of, of Zala and he's willing to put roughly 200 acres of land in preservation if the numbers make sense. And we are participating with Kestrel. Okay. We're going to keep it moving, but yes, Andy. Just one, last oh, just one last question on this. I'm sorry, I forgot to ask this beforehand. In the CPA questions and answers um, document, you guys asked a question about funding and whether it could be delayed a year, and I think the answer was that if this was in FY21, you might be able to work with the Kestrel Trust so that the property might still be able to be acquired, but in a CPA funding for, say, next year instead of this coming fiscal year. Um, is that still possible, and is that something that you guys considered as you were considering funding here versus all of the other priorities this year? Yeah. Jim, hold on. Thank you. We did talk about that and, and asked about that. That was something we considered. In the end, uh, the committee as a whole was persuaded. We had a very unusual situation of three very high priority projects. In the end, uh, they all rose to enough level there, that there, there was funding available for it and it didn't make, there, there wasn't a compelling reason to delay it. And from what we understood from, from staff was, although, in a worst case scenario, that was uh, a potential backup option that would have put stress on the whole project. Okay. Yes, Shalini. Um, I was wondering how do you assess the value of the land? For example, the Hickory Ridge land, which is wetlands and it cannot be developed. So how do you arrive at the $200,000 figure for that? Well, I believe it was from the appraisal. Is that right? Yes. So every, every, it's a great question. Every property that a municipality proposes to buy for whatever purpose, affordable housing, um, a gas station for intersection or open space, uh, has to have a th at least one, sometimes two or even three uh, third party appraisals. So all of these properties that we're proposing to purchase some or all of have been appraised by a third party uh, expert appraiser. And that's where we arrive at, at the value. So whether it's the Zala property, the Keats Haskins, or uh, Hickory Ridge, all of them have been appraised. What I wanna make clear, and not to mix projects, but um, right now we're only asking for $200,000 of CPA money for Hickory Ridge. That is not the appraised value of Hickory Ridge. The appraised value of Hickory Ridge is many times that, but we're only asking for 200,000 in CPA dollars. This is, on Zala, the appraised value of that 23 acres. Okay. Anything else, in Dorothy? Okay, because, yeah, we don't, uh, we want to go on and hear the presentations then. Oh, you had, yes. Yeah, I just, I have questions on a couple of their pieces of property before we move to the next group. Um, uh, on Keat Haskins, um, no doubt this is a good thing to buy, so it's not questioning that. Um, it's similar to a question we were just asking about how you come up with the value. I saw in the Q&A uh, that there was no attempt to negotiate a lower price, um, and I see that there's a grant coming in to do that. So the question is, could you could there be an attempt to negotiate a lower price? So that that's put as, I, I mean, that just flagged my attention on, no, we haven't tried yet. 
because it's actually a pretty big purchase when the grant comes in um, for the person who's selling. Yeah. So another, another great question. So I don't recall the specifics of the Q&A uh, that we responded to, but suffice it to say that every time the town negotiates with any landowner, there's always a conversation about appraised value and could there be a bargain sale? So the answer, and I'm not sure the specifics of that um, document that was prepared probably many months ago, we have asked the owner if they would take a lower price, and the answer has been no. Mm -hmm. So we always do that. We're always looking for the best bargain, and that then translates into can we get grant funding to offset or replace uh, any local funds? So in this case, we were able to get a $400,000 state grant uh, to help with that purchase. Um, and again, one comment about all three, and I've been doing this a long time, um, I do truly believe that our land acquisition program is actually gearing down, it's not gearing up. We happen to, by luck, simply by luck, come to a point where three stellar properties that have been on the list for years all came together at the same time. This has not happened in my career. I don't expect it really, frankly, with the town to ever happen again. Um, so it, it's just unusual that you have these three opportunities. I don't think we will ever see this, this, the planets align like this again. So they're all wonderful. If we didn't have Hickory Ridge and we were just looking at the other two, you'd say these are spectacular, but there's been a lot of focus on Hickory Ridge, but the other two are, are equally uh, stunning properties with wetlands, with riverfront, with river protection, with wonderful um, other attributes, so. Yes. Okay, uh, just the last property. Um, again, no no doubt about, oh, oh did, did Mandy have one on this piece too? Okay. Yeah. So th this one actually goes to this piece in some sense and also the trails, So, but I'm gonna combine them so I don't have to do it. And you know, in your presentation you said trail maintenance, trail creation, bridge maintenance can be paid for by CPA and this project the Keat Haskins land, you didn't indicate that you would build any trails, yet one of the purposes for purchasing this is that it connects already created open space. So is there a future plan to create trails? Since I, I, I think one of the purposes of acquiring land like this is to have it accessible to the public, and without trails, it's not really accessible. And would those, if, if there is a plan in the future, would that plan go back to the CPA for the maintenance portion since CPA funds can be paid for by that. And that goes to my question about just trail maintenance in general. Is there, by the CPA committee, some sort of plan in the future to regularly fund maintenance of, CP, maintenance of trails on CPA purchased land so that that money can maintain, be maintained in CPA given the town goal of moving capital that can be paid for by CPA to CPA um, versus out of the capital budget. I hope that was understandable. Can I answer the, I'll answer the last part first. Um, uh, we're fully aware that uh, in addition to the possibility of a trail system and a newly purchased piece of land that um, many properties in town, uh, open space properties with trails and bridges are in really rough shape. And I think um, in, a, in a different year, uh, when we maybe did not have three major, interesting, really compelling properties to think about purchasing, we very well may have funded the full $50,000 request. And I think part of the discussion that we had in the committee with, with Mr. Zomik was that we would like the town to come back to us um, so that we can really start making the proper investments in these properties. Okay. Okay, my last question is actually related to what Mandy just said. Now I'm turned to Hickory Ridge, uh, which is a terrific piece of property to buy. If CPA money is used for this piece and some other purchase uh, gets the piece that you said would be more, part of it would be developed, so it wasn't conservation. If the other piece had trails that connected to the piece you bought, so how literal is it that you... CPA money purchased this acre, but other money purchased another. And I'm thinking of Mill River, where you can come back in and 
be rethinking it? Can you, would you be able to come back in and think of the whole area if more of it was public? Can I, I just also, there was a part of Mandy's, your question that wasn't answered on Keith Haskins, I so just quickly on that. So we didn't come right out in the grant proposals and in the CPAC proposals to say we want trails in part because we knew we had two other properties that have trails already semi-established. Um, and I'm a little cautious these days about adding new trails. We have over 80 miles of trails already in town. And as you said in your other part of your question, we need money to, to maintain those trails. So the town's, uh, town staff, uh, through me, we would like to come back every year to try to see back, to try to get money to enhance and, and uh, improve the trails. So down the line somewhere, Keith Haskins will likely have trails and bridges. But at this point, in the net, if we are successful in acquiring it, it wouldn't be a high priority for us at this time. But in the future, it could likely connect to uh, Haskins Meadow across the way. In answer to the question about Hickory Ridge, um, so what I've been saying all along throughout the process, uh, public and, and in various meetings with CPAC and, and others, is that if we are successful in moving forward with this acquisition, we would have some, we would create some sort of um, collective master plan for the site that would include looking very carefully at what lands would be protected, what lands would be for solar, where trails could be, and what other uses the land might um, uh, offer the town. It could be, and, and we would look at affordable housing options, we would look at uh, private options of potentially um, selling off part of the property for some use. Uh, it might support a restaurant like it does today, or a brewery, or any number of uses where the current uh, clubhouse is. It has a wonderful parking lot. We would want to retain all or most of that parking lot for multiple uses, including public access. So um, as part of this process, we will be coming to, if this moves forward, we will be coming to the town council with a conceptual map showing those areas that may be retained for development or other uses by the town or another entity in the future with those areas identified that will be preserved on the map as well. And of course, the solar is about 23 acres of the 150. So that map will be forthcoming next week um, to, the, to the council through the, the, the process. I hope that answers that question. Mr. Alden. Just, just want to add one, one small observation related to what uh, was just said that that of course, because of the differential values, the wetlands being much less valuable than the than the developable portion, even though 200,000 is only a, a fairly small fraction of the total purchase price, it would the the land ratio would be very different. So, so the bulk of the land that the town purchased probably would be conservation. Okay. So, anything else on open space conservation? Recreation. Uh, recreation. Part of. Um, I want to ask some more questions about Groff Park. Um, I was trying an experiment and I asked somebody I didn't know what was their major complaint about Amherst and this very first person who did not mention a pothole or a sidewalk was upset about Groff Park and I said, oh, why? We're doing some wonderful new things there, but I had no details. And when I looked at the picture, I couldn't really tell what was going to be where, what you're doing. I, so I think it's important um, that you tell us the good things that are going to be happening at Groff Park. Dave? So thank you for the, the comment. Um, and again, perhaps we can improve our, our outreach on this. Um, there is a lot of information on the web about the project because it's been underway for a couple of years. But I'm excited to say that we are under construction right now with a, a wonderful project there that includes a spray park as well as a playground and pavilion, uh, kind of a new entryway to that area. Um, so contractors are on site. People can go down and, and take a look now. It's all fenced off for safety, of course. But the goal would be over the next couple of months to complete that project and have a grand opening sometime this summer. Our hope is July, but um, we will have a, a more firm date as that moves forward. 
Um, but it's a, a very exciting project that has been supported by the LSSE Commission. Uh, of course, the C CPA uh, uh, has been very supportive of the project throughout, and formerly the Select Board uh, and uh, Town Meeting. So um, we feel very good about the project. It's going to serve South Amherst, but we think it's going to be a, a real regional uh, attraction for people in Amherst, and, and uh, it'll be a great, um, a great amenity there. At the same time, we're also improving the sidewalks and creating a multi-purpose path on East Hadley Road, which will help to provide safe access for people who live on East Hadley Road who can just bike, walk, or come with a stroller or rollerblade or, or uh, whatnot from East Hadley Road over to Grove Park in the summer. So uh, look for more improvements there and an announcement about a ribbon cutting in the, in the coming weeks and months. Yeah, please, yeah. shall we? I just want to add to the Groff Park because I found it very exciting that one, the vision of the town is to take the programs to the different communities and the Groff Park is going to be used for one of the sites where uh, youth programs will be held right there rather than expecting people to come to Bank Center and so forth. Okay. So are we uh, ready to move on to the next section? I just uh, There's one thing I meant to say earlier and I want to make it clear now so that nobody misunderstands. Um, the charge to the Finance Committee is to uh, advise the Council on all financial matters. Um, I have decided that I am not going to get into the business of parsing out whether a question is financial or not for the purposes of today's meeting. Um, whether a financial consider is something as a financial consideration or not in our recommendations, we may discuss at a later time. I am not going to attempt to parse questions today. Um, so I just, for sake of the council, I wanted to make sh that clear. Um, so going back then to the uh, plan, um, is it your, uh, which you want to go to historic preservation, please? Okay. Uh, the first item that we have for historical preservation is a, a preservation plan update. This is a $25,000 uh, CPA grant. Uh, the Mass Historical Council recommends that uh, local historical commissions every five years undertake a preservation plan. And, and this is to sort of look at inventory, to take public comment, um, to identify uh, maybe new areas that have come up for possible preservation projects so that um, local historical societies can be continually up to date in what they may want to focus on for CPA proposals and other things. Uh, we haven't done one in 13 years. So the feeling was that we were really overdue for the historical commission um, to be able to fund a preservation plan update. And this would be basically to fund a consultant to help sort of get us up to speed with what our current needs are. Um, the West Cemetery Headstone uh, Restoration Project, which is a $50,000 uh, proposal, this is a really interesting one and is part of a um, longer term restoration project in the West Cemetery. Um, the plan is to, is to um, uh, bring in a, an outfit that specializes in gravestone ret uh, um, restoration and to take about 50 or 60 of the most badly damaged headstones uh, in West Cemetery that date from kind of post-Civil War uh, stones um, and to you know, reset to uh, replace broken headstones to clean uh, headstones. Um, uh, so that the, 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 we don't lose more um, infrastructure that we have in that cemetery. And uh, this is a particularly interesting part of the, um, of the cemetery with some uh, notable figures from our history and African-American families and some of the early Irish Catholic families in, in Amherst. So as you know, this has been going on for a couple of years. This is um, another leg of this. Uh, preservation plan for this really important historical resource in town. Uh, North Amherst Community Farm, this is a $30,000 grant from CPA. So last year, CPA awarded a grant to the North Amherst Community Farm to repair 
the exterior of uh, their house on North Pleasant Street. And um, th they've been doing a complete rehabilitation of this beautiful building that had really been in disrepair uh, until the work began. They, um, they actually, through some really good fiscal management, uh, uh, spent significantly less money than we had awarded them in the exterior restoration. So they returned that money to us, and I think I, I don't know what it ended up to be. At last I heard, it was between thirteen and sixteen thousand dollars that they had left. I'm not sure exactly what came back in, but they requested uh, a CPA grant to um, instead of replacing the windows with modern windows to restore the um, original windows. Uh, and this was to, again, to maintain the sort of historical integrity to this building, which they, has been a priority for them. Um, so, um, so that's what we're doing with this. And this is going to, this building is pretty close to completion, as I understand it. Go ahead, please. Yeah. Uh, just two, two points to add on that. They, they did, they just actually had an open house the other day. Uh, some of you might have been there, so uh, showing it off, it's it is beautiful inside. It's been uh, remodeled to serve the farm well while preserving these historic features. Uh, I just want to point out that their request for the windows was was more than we were able to approve because the money hadn't they hadn't yet reported back the final money. So so there may be an additional uh, sixteen thousand request coming. Uh, that's correct, right? Yeah. Uh, so the last historical preservation uh, item is a data migration uh, for Jones Library. Um, so th this is a, a, a pretty important proposal. This is to take about 5,000 uh, records that are uh, in, in digital images that are currently stored in Excel and to really bring them up into something a little more publicly accessible, both to scholars and to, to interested citizens, and to put them into a collective access, which is a, an open source, state-of-the-art collections management system. Um, and this will be uh, on the Jones database. So this really makes it on their server. So this will make it much more easy, uh, much simpler to access both what artifacts, um, that, that we possess and, again, make it available to scholars, make it available to anyone doing uh, research or inquiring um, into what we have. And that is a little over $22,000 proposal. So those are our historical preservation projects. So let me pause just to see if there are any questions from the council about uh, historic preservation proposals. Yeah. I, I I actually just have a comment on the farmhouse because I thought what was interesting with that support is in a way it's an employment project as well as a historic. It's um, housing farmers and training and providing them a place to live. So you, you created housing um, to enable a farm to farm in a particular way. So it, it has a nice mix that cuts across farmland and conservation. So I don't know how many opportunities there are like that, but it was uh, it was so creative when you see, took the tour and saw who was going to be living there. Yeah. On, on the library data migration, is that the total cost of this data transfer, or is this um, the first payment for an ongoing process? Uh, I believe it's the total cost. Yes. That's how I understand it. Seeing nothing else, I, um, I know we have res um, also request for $10,000 for administrative expenses and um, funds for repayment of um, prior debt on um, CPA projects who were funded with uh, previously approved debt. Um, those are standard parts of each CPA proposal every year. and. Um, I don't think that we really need to have a presentation of those again unless there's any questions from 
the counselors have, but those are standard items. Um, but if there's agreement, that would allow us to go on and talk about the community housing proposals and okay. turn it back to you. Okay. Uh, so the first uh, proposal we have is a, um, a $200,000 um, grant to Municipal Affordable Housing Trust. The original request was, I believe, for $400,000. Um, this is, there's two parts of this. One is a, a $40,000 request to fund uh, a consultant. We funded this last year as well. Um, to, uh, to, to sort of work with the trust to plan and oversee development projects. This is someone that became very, very highly recommended to the town. Uh, and we really felt that given the commitment that the town has to affordable housing that this was really money well spent to bring in someone with this level of expertise and planning for affordable housing. Um, the remainder of this uh, proposal is uh, to some extent in anticipation of the East Street School project and to allow flexibility for the trust um, to have funds to be able to um, expeditiously sort of plan for um, sort of pre-construction costs and the rehabilitation of the East Street School. It, it, it's possible some of this money won't get spent this year, but we wanted to give them the flexibility uh, to, to have this for this, which will be another very um, uh, exciting and important affordable housing project that's coming down the road. Uh, Amherst Community Connections. Uh, this is a program that we've been funding in one way or another for a couple of years. Um, this is working through Amherst Community Connections. This is a little over $116,000 grant to uh, support a rental subsidy program. This is for people in town who um, are among our most vulnerable people when it comes to housing insecurity. These are $400 monthly vouchers. Um, uh, six of them per year, uh, lasting for three years. This is to help um, people transitioning, largely helping people transition out of homelessness into a more stable housing situation with other support systems, not funded by CPA, um, to help them with employment and really move out of homelessness into a more self-sustaining um, lifestyle. And then uh, finally is, uh, a, 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 I don't want to speak for the whole committee, but I think this was a proposal that there was almost sort of uniform excitement about immediately um, among the CPA committee. Uh, this is Valley CDC's proposal to create um, a studio apartment housing project uh, near the Amherst College football field. This is to uh, they purchased the house, and it's to put an addition onto this house that would, that would in, in, in combination with the house, have 28 single resident occupancy studio apartments for among our most vulnerable citizens in town. These would be people who, um, again, transitioning out of homelessness, uh, low-income folks, disabled people, uh, retired um, uh, people who are working with um, Department of Mental Health State Department of Mental Health Services to give them stable, safe housing in a location that's close to town. This is a $500,000 CPA grant that is part of um, Valley CDC's uh, total cost. Okay. Um, note that Councillor Schreiber has just joined us. Um, I have one question that I'm going to ask, and I'm going to turn it over to other members of the um, council to ask questions about housing proposals. So on the Amherst Community Connections, you mentioned that there have been two, uh, that there have been prior proposals. Last year, it was called the Housing Stabilization Program, and in FY17, Housing Stability Program. Um, is it essentially the same program? And if so, have the, was, has there been an evaluation process for looking at 
the success of those programs um, that informed your thinking as you made your recommendation? So th there's, uh, this is a slightly different program from the program that's been funded in the past. The, the program in the past was really focused on bringing people out of homelessness. Uh, th this is, is um, a subsidy program really focused at people maybe, you know, with us who have housing, but the housing is or has become insecure. Uh, so perhaps they've lost a job or have had an illness or, or the rents faced rental rent increase. So, so the first part of the question is not quite the same program, though it's built on many of the same, many of the same components in terms of using a, a subsidy, in terms of providing those surround support services that, as, as Nate made clear, are not funded by CPA, but from other, other resources. And um, although we, CPA committee isn't in a position to actually carry out evaluations ourselves, but we did ask for and receive uh, reports from the program and uh, they, they were able to show uh, they, they had um, one of the big successes with the previous, with, with the other programs, which are still ongoing, the one, one of them is still ongoing, is that um, although in that program they, the, the potential was for, for a subsidy to be used by a single beneficiary for, for, for a couple of years, uh, in fact, they were able to transition them. In a number of cases, they were, were getting permanent um, uh, I'm blanking on the, the ter term, but work, they worked with the Amherst Housing Authority to get other types of, of bring, bring other types of, of housing support into Amherst, and then the support, the CPA money that they were using could then transfer on to, to a second beneficiary and a third mm -hmm. beneficiary. So, so they, they had pretty good reports uh, in, in that way, and, and were, and as I say, we're, we're bringing in other resources in, in conjunction with the CPA money. So uh, the committee felt that this particular, you know, while we're looking, you know, a lot of committee members feel strongly that it's important to be addressing affordable housing with, with solutions that are ongoing, such as the Valley CDC project or the E Street project. But in the interim, we're, we're also very aware that, that, that there are many individuals in fair, you know, who, who are at risk right now and who need support right now. So the goal was to, to do some of both. Okay, thank you. So um, I'm opening up to other members of the council and questions about any of the historic preservation or housing, excuse me, his housing requests, thank you, community housing requests, and so Mandy. So I, I've got a couple, but I'm going to stay on this one since that's where we are. Um, the, I, I want to describe it as overhead, but the management fee, um, if I did my math correctly, is approximately 13-ish percent of the whole request, um, $55 a month for each $400 a month subsidy approximately 13%, I think. Um, is that a typical management fee seen in this type of program? Um, I have no reference, so that's why I'm asking whether that's typical, high, low, and if, if you don't know, did you, did you ask? I'm just trying to get a reference here on that portion of the proposal. Quilling may be able to answer that if that's okay. Um, you need to you need to hold the button on the microphone while you speak on the. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very and much. Please for identify me. yourself. My name is Huilin Greeny, and I'm the executive director and founder of Amherst Community Connections. Thank you for this question regarding the management fee. Yes, um, we have had two um, funding so far. Uh, very graciously uh, want to acknowledge the CPA, the support for the Housing First. And uh, in each um, <clears throat> Housing First, <clears throat> we charge $50. 
and $55 depending on when the grant was written. And the management fee of $55 is typical uh, industry standard for us to work with the landlord to do the um, uh, helping the tenant to pay for the rent. And every month we do have to reach out to the tenants to help collect their fees and to be provided. So therefore, this is uh, typical to $55 that we have been doing for the past three years. Okay. Again, uh, I, I was just going to stay on the same project. Um, if I understand correctly, these s subsidies and help go to housing that wouldn't be classified otherwise within our affordable group. Um, do are there inspections of the properties um, and management? And I'm asking this in terms of is that part of the management fee or the overhead? Because actually, a few people who have received some of this help, have talked about uh, landlords not always maintaining it. So in terms of if it's part of our housing stock and we're not counting it as affordable, how do we do oversight? So is there additional resources, town inspectors coming in, um, making sure we're uh, buying people into decent housing, not where the landlord can take advantage because they're getting a subsidy so you can charge a higher rent? Thank you, if I could uh, reply. Yes, uh, so when we, for example, in our housing first uh, housing, that we have worked with the town and at their requirement that we have to work with landlord who can produce a permit to state that they have done the self-certification past the town's requirement every year. So we only rent from uh, landlords who could produce such a certificate before we are willing to sign the lease. And so far we have uh, done this with all the reputable uh, real estate uh, rental agencies. Okay. Again, I'm open to any questions from any council, counselor about any community housing proposal. Ms. Haneke. I, I, I have, sorry. I'm I feel like I'm taking up a lot of time. Um, but um, I wanted to move to the East Street School one, the 200,000. Um, my reading of the proposal, I think you mentioned this, was that it's not necessarily directly for assisting in the developing of East Street School, that the, it would go into the AMAHT trust fund, the housing trust fund, for use for any um, affordable housing project, but right now they're hoping to be able to use it for the East Street School project, but it would be available for any project. So I guess my question is, if it ends up being used for East Street, would CPA, you know, if, if we start funding that trust fund, um, does then a developer for, say, the East Street School project also have the ability to come back to CPA and request CPA funds specifically, or is the goal to have all of the developers go directly to the housing trust to be requesting the funds from the housing trust specifically. If that's, I, I know the proposal talked about multiple hundreds of thousands every year into the trust fund that they'd like to see. So it, I guess it's more of a forward thinking question of, is this a way to have the housing trust manage the developer requests for funds in town and CPA just grant that money across or might a developer start getting funds from both CPA funds that have been given to the Housing Trust and also CPA funds that have not been granted to the Housing Trust. It's an interesting question. I don't think that's something that we, I think the expectation is we're gonna come back to this in one form or another probably next year. Um, I would just add that, I mean, there, there's two parts to that question, I think, and so, um, one is definitely an ongoing discussion between CPA and the Housing Trust on, about uh, the management of these funds. And, one, and part of that discussion is they have, uh, they're developing a, a, a plan and a strategy and are more focused on housing and, and have um, professional guidance so they have a lot of strengths to bring to housing at the same time they're 
their choice of focus is more narrow than, than the full suite of housing that CPA might fund. So the question over time that will be figured out over time, I think, by, by successive committees is going to be how much money gets transferred in advance to be held by them versus you know, how they might come and request funds. To the second half of the question, I, I would suspect that for a project like East Street, if it's being managed by the, the Housing Trust Fund, I, I wouldn't think that CPA would look to them to ask for funds. I would assume that we wouldn't expect the developer to be coming to us with separate requests that we would want them they might make a request with the developer, but that, uh, that's a personal assumption. Chalney. Sonia, did you have a supplemental? Yeah, I just want to clarify for everybody that the Amherst Municipal Housing Trust is a town trust. So the money that gets transferred over is still in the town treasury, it's just in a different fund. It's still through, it still has to go through all the approvals and all the follow all the rules that the town does. It doesn't just go to a, another entity. Um, so firstly, I just want to, uh, this is for the CDC project. I want to acknowledge the work that CDC has done to address each and every concern that we've been getting and some very legit concerns, but just want to thank them for a very detailed response to that. And one thing, the response might be there, but I'm not clear, is why is the cost per unit looking much higher than um, the the norm in town for you know for per area of construction. If I could get more information about that, I believe there's someone here from Valley CDC. Yeah. Yeah. Um, why don't we get? Uh, there's a microphone that Delaney has. And I have questions yeah. And please identify yourself. So. Thank you. Is it on? Uh, my name is Laura Baker. I'm the real estate project manager for Valley CDC. Um, and I, I think it's a question of framing this price within the price of developing affordable housing in general. So we're looking at a per unit total development cost under 200000 which is extremely rare in Massachusetts. Um, I don't think we've ever, I don't think we've done one before. So typically we're looking at around 350000 per unit for developing affordable housing. Um, in the Boston area, they're getting up into well into 400000 per unit. Um, the state discourages people coming in over 500000 per unit, but they have funded them. So I think the bigger question is, why is it so expensive to develop affordable housing? Um, and some of it is regulatory. Some of it is the goals that we're trying to meet, meet for energy efficiency, for handicapped accessibility. Um, you know, compliance with environmental requirements, many lawyers looking at everything. So affordable housing as a, as a type of housing, I think can be more expensive than uh, private development. This particular project that's coming forward, and we'd be happy to provide comparative data, is very inexpensive relative to other types of projects for affordable housing. Uh, Pat. I just wanted to add to what you Please were use your microphone. I'm I, sorry. My finger is on it. <laughs> Thank you. I'm not hearing it. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> um, I, I just want to add that uh, one of the times that um, you were presenting, you talked about, uh, and this got confirmed by other people, about the cost of putting in individual bathrooms in each of these units. There's, yeah, and bathroom plumbing, et cetera, is extremely expensive. Sure. So that contributes yeah. as well. The, the square foot cost of construction for this type of housing, a studio apartments, would inevitably be higher than for multi-bedroom dwellings. Um, bedrooms are relatively cheap to build. Kitchens and bathrooms are very expensive to build. Um, this property also we're hoping to equip with an elevator, which is a, you know, a more high cost item. Um, cost of property in Amherst is expensive. So all of those things kind of get rolled into uh, the total development cost of the, of the project. Yes, um, Dorothy. A question about what is included in the um, units. Um, are they air conditioned or is the building air conditioned? And I asked you yesterday about wireless and I assume people have TV or cable. So what is included in the individual units is essentially an open room uh, with a kitchenette and a private bathroom in each unit. Um, 
air conditioning, uh, we would expect to have central air conditioning in this building. Um, and so each unit would have its own thermostat with a, probably a floor and a ceiling, uh, both for heat and for air conditioning in the summer. Uh, in the rent, we include heat, hot water, and electric, plug-in electric. We don't typically include phone and cable and Wi-Fi, although since Dorothy had suggested it to us, we will take a look at that as well because she made the point that Wi-Fi in particular can be really expensive um, and has, you know, we all know, it's become kind of more of a stable, staple utility for people these days. Um, but the basic things to live and, and inhabit the, the unit are all included. Good evening. Kathy. Um, I'm I want to go back to the, um, uh, the East Street School uh, proposal. Um, building on what Mandy was asking, um, I looked at the Q&A and it looked like one of the reasons you went down from 400,000 to 200,000 because right now it's not quite clear exactly when it'll be needed and it's uh, because you still have an RFP building pieces. So my question was if we look at the whole package later, could this potentially be postponed to be funded at and during the next fiscal year, or is there an impact of delay of this amount of money? Um, and this, I was getting it back partly just from the Q and A. It looked like there was some flexibility on whether it's FY20 or earlier in FY21. Um, I think I think there is that flexibility. Okay. And then on Valley CDC, can I just continue? So, yes. Um, the way the budget works when I you nicely present all the numbers and show that it adds to more money than you have to allocate in cash and then this one is scheduled to be debt financed and I don't exactly understand how the debt financing works so do you have basically the intention of doing the 500k when the whole thing gets ready to go, so when they actually need the money, so the state needs it, and are we holding it in escrow, is it money? Um, does it make a difference if we said we want it to be cash rather than debt finance? So it's a, it's a question of, you've gone over budget to put that in, but it works because you're gonna DB debt financing. I just want to understand that better. Would you like to have Ms. Aldrich respond? Can you? <laughs> I can talk about the borrowing and the mechanisms of that, but whether um, the money has to go up front for the package to work or not, usually we, we pay these as a reimbursement where we get um, documentation showing that we're reimbursing. Maybe Dave Zomek or Nate could talk about the, uh, Nate Malloy could talk about the housing mechanism. mechanism. Sorry, Nate. Yeah. Mr. Malloy. Thanks. The, um, the question, I mean, I, I guess so the idea is that the 500,000, you know, the CPA committee expects that future CPA funds would then be allocated to pay this debt service. So, you know, not, you know, so they're over their budget now, right? So they have a certain cap now, and then the authorization is to borrow the money. So the town would set aside a repayment period of 10 years and then all future CPA funds would go to pay off that debt service. Valley CDC would need that, you know, the commitment when their project starts and as Sonia said, it's a, the town, you know, would secure the funding through grant agreements and a deed restriction and, and then we'd reimburse the expense. Um, we can structure it a few different ways with Valley but really it's, um, I think for the CPA, it's, you know, money that would be used in future years to, you know, CPA funds to pay back the project. Is that Verify. I think so because I was just looking at the the optimist the optimistic timeline. You know, and when it if everything went well, you got the grant to build, and when construction, you don't need that money till two years from now. So I was wondering if there's interest bond. What I think of debt is you go out and you've got interest payments. So you're saying we're we're not really spending any money right. until two years from now. Correct. Okay. And I don't think we would under the circumstances as described, borrow the money until we um, actually need to use the money so we're not incurring interest costs during the period that the money is not in use. Um, 
but uh, if this were voted by the council, um, and it would require a two-thirds vote of the council because it's a bonding authorization vote, um, it would then stand as a bond authorization. It's not the issuance of a bond. Right. When, once you authorize the debt on this, we would not borrow any money until the project started and um, they wanted to start spending the money. And we would just borrow what we need for that fiscal year end. If it goes over two fiscal years, we would not permanently borrow until the whole project was done. So our, our interest doesn't accrue the minute you, st you authorize the debt. It wouldn't happen until we actually borrowed funds. I, I, I'm sorry to, to stay on this, but suppose we decided we do it in cash, so the drawdown, two years worth of 250 each, um, then it wouldn't be debt, but you would still be doing this. You know, we're going to pay, and it would start. In two, so, do we have that flexibility that we can either do it as debt or we could do it as uh, in a different way? We have that flexibility in any of our projects, but I'm not sure about the flexibility of the of the project. It's right, so that relates to Each particular to one. Okay, so that relates to their funding showing a match for the state. You know, I'm just trying to understand, yeah. And well, just keep in mind that we, you can't appropriate more money than, than is there, and so you, you couldn't do it as cash without subtracting something else out of our recommendation. That's why I was asking about which things might be able to be postponed, and do we need to put anything in this year? I'm just literally trying to look at the cash flow side of it, yeah. Andy. So I have two questions on the Valley CDC project. One relates to the borrowing, but the other one relates to the budget that was presented by Valley CDC. In the sources of funding, one was listed as Amherst CPA slash trust, and another one about five lines down after the Housing Innovation Fund just said Housing Trust Fund. And we have a Housing Municipal Affordable Housing Trust Fund is that the housing trust fund from Amherst or is it a different trust fund? So that's my question on the budget. As to borrowing, um, and she's shaking her head, so I'm assuming it's not an Amherst, the Amherst housing trust fund. Okay, the borrowing, I noticed that our current borrowing for CPA in terms of debt service is at $420,000 of our approximately $1 million that comes in every year from, from tax money. Um, so that's... 42% right now is already pre-allocated. Um, if does CPA committee have a target for pre-allocation of debt service? Like how much don't you want to pre-allocate? Is there a top percentage? Is there a low percentage? What's your goal there? And what would um, borrowing a half a million dollars do to that in the future, given that only one project is being retired this year? The the historic preservation project of the town hall. Um, and only one is being retired next year. The rest are for, most of them are four or more years out from retirement. There's only one that's in year eight of 10. Most other ones have a bunch more years left. So what would this do to that? And how would that limit the ability to fund new projects in future years? Well, any bonding inhibits our ability to do further projects in the future because it's that much less money we're going to have to spend. Um, and, and I, you know, Sonia could maybe tell you the d specific impact of borrowing $500,000. Um, I think in general, the committee is pretty conservative about bonding um, for just the reasons that it gives us less f flexibility in years to come. And I think this year w was interesting in the sense that we, we, Again, I don't want to speak for the committee as a whole, but I think in general, these were unusually compelling projects this year. Um, and we did reject a number of projects. Um, but I, I, I didn't know if, if Sonia, have a, if you have a sense of the direct impact on, on the, the borrowing on our... Well, that would depend on whether we're borrowing for 10 years or five years right. or 20 years. But... Um, Something like this we'd probably do over 10 years, so it'd be 50,000 plus interest. And interest rates we usually project with is about between four and 5% we're being told right now. Yes. Yeah. Uh, thanks, I just wanna respond quickly. So on the debt service there, for instance, um, you know, the Hawthorne property is in year nine of 10, and that was for um, half a million. So you can see that you know, that's 52,000 a year. 
uh, rolling green is 1.25 million, and that's what it is on year five of 10, and then you know, the write down will be less as you get closer to, the, to retirement. And so you know, it, it, it does vary based on you know, how much initial borrowing is in, in then the write down period. So that just gives you a sense for what it was for two housing projects. Jim, did you have anything? Uh, I, that was part of what I was going to say. But so again, while there'd be uh, while there'd be one year where the debt service would be a bit higher than this year, uh, if we don't borrow over the next two years, the following year it will be a bit lower because because of those uh, um, projects that you noted are going off this year and next. Lynn? Yes, I'd actually like for my purposes and the purposes of other people to understand the next steps in this project and what is needed from the town council and then what would the Valley CDC be doing as they move forward. Ms. Baker. I'll try to summarize. So we are at the phase of the project where we essentially have schematic level designs appropriate for starting to share with people, starting to take comment from people. Um, we are just beginning that conversation. We did have a meeting with some of the immediate neighbors and abutters. Uh, we anticipate having a larger community meeting as well. I see that the town has just put up a web page, which is wonderful to, to kind of be a repository of information about the project. Um, we would need to go to one of the state subsidizing agencies to get what's called a project eligibility letter. Um, essentially, they take a look at the project uh, to see if it meets fundamental criteria uh, for subs subsidy. Uh, they do a site visit. They write to the town uh, for comment. Uh, and then if they give you one, the project eligibility letter, it is one of the threshold criteria for applying for a comprehensive zoning permit which is a type of state level zoning that is only used for affordable housing. Uh, it is the type of permit we anticipate using for this project. So we need to have site control and that letter from the state in hand to be able to submit to the Zoning Board of Appeals for zoning approval. Um, it's called a comprehensive permit because the ZBA is the kind of middle of the spokes of the wheel, so to say, with gathering input. So they gather they notify abutters, they gather neighborhood and abutter input, and then they coordinate with all the other local boards. So, you know, fire, police, planning board, anybody who might have something to say about the project. They kind of hold all of that information. Um, they hold public hearings. Typically, it's a series of public hearings that take place. They ask the developer questions. Uh, we answer those questions. It's an iterative process. They can request us to make changes in the project. We can say, we'd love to. We can't. Here's why. It's, it's typically something about the project evolves during the course of that permitting process. Um, if we come out the other end with a permit, uh, then we take that permit, we have to have one, in order to apply for state resources. Um, when we apply for state resources, they not only want to see that approved permit, they want to see all other funds committed. So when you look at the budget for this project, which is right now a budget, right? We're speculating about what sources we'll get. Um, by the time we go in for the state, and the state funds the bulk of the project, we have to show a letter which is what we're requesting now from CPC that says, yes, we will, if you are able to raise all the other money that you need and get the permit and you are ready to construct this project, we will commit this $500,000. Um, so some of the urgency for us is being ready to do that. When we go in for the project eligibility letter, the state looks to us and says, we're gonna evaluate whether your project is viable. Part of viability is a financial analysis. If we're saying, yeah, we're gonna have some local money in it, but we don't have any way to back that up, um, it becomes a question in the mind of the state. So it helps us compete. It helps us show viability at the state level. Um, the competition for state level affordable housing dollars is fierce. Um, people sometimes apply year after year to get those funds. So this is, this is a long-term process. Um, if there are delays at any point in the process, it makes it an even longer process. And so that was one of the things I was trying to communicate to the town is that, you know, we do have an extended public process before us. 
um, and we want to try to control those things that we can control in terms of being making timely progress um, during the project. Um, if the state funds the project, uh, then we usually have about a six-month period of finalizing documents and closing on the financing. Um, a construction on a project like this would probably be 12 to 14 months. Uh, we would be doing uh, about six months before construction completion, we would do it, be doing marketing for the project. Uh, typically, there's a lottery to select tenants. You usually have many, many more applications from tenants than you have spaces. Um, and then when it's all built and people are selected according to that lottery, uh, people move in. The ZBA and the town have the right to request a local preference uh, be applied to the project. The state decides that. One uh, town needs to submit evidence that they have local demand, which I don't think will be a problem in this case. Um, and the town can re request up to 70% of the units be local preference, which uh, means people are either living now in Amherst or working now in Amherst. That's one of the definitions of local preference. Okay. Um. Just looking around, and I'll come back to you, okay, uh, Kathy. It, there was one other I had on my notes. Um, if it moves forward to actually opening up, um, if there was a need for a crosswalk, if there was a need to move a bus stop, if you know, so they're related but not the housing project. Are there plans that the town would be able to do that? Does Valley CDC work to? to supplement and, you know, questions about the support services located in the project itself. If you determined you needed more than what you've got in the current budget, do you have resources you would draw on? You know, so it's, you don't know yet yeah. until Is it's up and running. Is your question about what's the total price tag really? For exactly. This okay. Um, so yeah, I think, again, as part of the zoning hearing, uh, they will look at traffic, safety, parking, all of those kinds of considerations. If they identified an infrastructure need that the project would create, I think there would be a negotiated discussion about how that happens. Um, we understand plans are already underway for improvements with crossing on, on this section of Northampton Road, so I don't anticipate that particular item coming up as a question. Um, in terms of supportive services, uh, we uh, hope to apply to the state for some rental subsidies um, for the tenants that are coming, that are defined as homeless. Um, we can at the same time ask for some supportive services dollars that are ongoing that would come to the project every year. Um, we also, when we looked at the operating budget, we are committing to dedicate some of the revenue, the rental income, also for services. Um, we have executed, I think, five memorandums of understanding with local social service providers that they agree that they would serve if and when tenants live in this building, they would provide services. Those agencies all have their own complex funding pattern. Um, we don't have in our forecast coming year after year to the town to ask for service dollars. We are anticipating using this state source as well as the, the revenue from the project to fund ongoing operations. It is our goal to not, to be self-reliant in that way and not be coming to the town every year, nor wondering if the town is gonna have resources every year, it would be uh, a risky position for us as well. So we wanna have it all kind of captured within the operating budget for the property. Okay, Dorothy. Um, I remember you have several categories of tenant, um, and I wondered how firmly those are tied to specific rooms. For example, if the higher paying ones whose money is um, integral to your budget plan, if the number of people for those dries up because they decide the space is too small or they got something better, um, do they stay at that, up to that income level or can, can you rearrange your categories? Uh, well, one thing I would add is that this, there are ceilings identified for different income tiers of tenants doesn't mean you couldn't take someone who has a lower income, you just can't take someone who has a higher income. Um, as long as they can afford a reasonable amount of their income to pay for rent. Um, typically the state does not mind, uh, lenders don't mind if you move to lower income tiers 
mostly people are putting money into projects like this trying to gain affordability in housing. So usually if you go that way, you don't, you have to get approval. We'd have to get approval from the town as well because you guys would have a deed restriction on this property identifying whatever those tiers are that your zoning board of appeals approves in a zoning permit. It's a permanent restriction, 99 years, runs with the property. So yeah, there could in theory be a negotiated process with the town and other lenders to change them. It, I, don't, I don't foresee that. I think part of having these different, you know, having different tiers at, at relatively small numbers of units means we're gonna have an oversupply of folks at all those different income tiers. We'll have a long wait list. I don't think we'll be compelled because of lack of market demand to change those income tiers. And I have a brief follow-up. When you mentioned lottery and pre-screening, um, do you pre-screen before somebody goes into the lottery or do they win the lottery and then see if they meet the pre-screening? Some of both. So there is um, usually an application that kind of opens the gate for someone to be in the lottery um, that does include things like reference checks, um, verification of income. Uh, once you're in the lottery and you're at the top, there are additional verifications that would go on to make sure that you are an eligible tenant for a unit. So it happens at both ends. Okay. Show me. So all the projects that I've looked at yours seem to be doing really amazing work in the communities and I was still wondering if looking back at what you've done so far, what improvements would you recommend in for our town and so what can we do as a town to make sure that this is a successful project for all the tenants and the neighbors? It's a great question. So a couple of lessons learned that we're bringing forward. Um, one is scale. So the smaller the development, the harder it is to make the budget work over time. And you know we all see operating costs escalating, costs of fuel, costs of taxes, all those things. So um, the scale of the property is a response to that experience. We want to have enough money to make capital repairs in the future. We want to have enough money to have services on site. None of our other comparable properties have um, on-site staff. And we're proposing that in this project, and partly it's because we're able to, because it's a little bit larger. Um, we just think it's a humane thing to do. It, um, it is not a response to any bad behavior on, on current tenants. It's really a quality of life issue for tenants. Um, so that's one lesson learned. Uh, I think the diversity of, of incomes in this property um, I don't know if it's a lesson learned. It was more a response to the, the comments that we got early planning this project from the town. The town said, you know, we, we really need a solution to all the people who are homeless in our town, but we don't want to congregate and segregate those people. And so most of the units in this property are not for homeless tenants. Um, they're for basically working, working wage earners. Um, and so, and that's different than in our other properties. We have a higher concentration of low-income and high-need people in our other SRO and studio apartment uh, buildings. I think it's a positive step. I, I think we agree that it's a better social envir environment for people to have that diversity. It also impacts scale because if you want to house a meaningful number of homeless people, but you don't want them to be in the majority, it also means you need to be at a certain size to do that. Um, so those are a number of, I think, lessons learned. Did you have anything? Yeah, and supportive services. You know, the importance of, we already have memorandums of understanding with service agencies, so we're not waiting. I mean, we're starting really out of the gate saying, who's in the community that we could tap to rely upon to support people if and when we build this? Um, and I think that's a trend statewide, that there's a realization that it's not enough always for people who are homeless to simply have a roof over their heads. They, we need to take proactive steps to make sure they can maintain that tenancy um, over time. And we've had a really good success rate um, doing that with formerly homeless tenants. Okay. I'm gonna look one more round to see if there are any counselors with questions, because if not, then I'm gonna um, see if there's public comment requested. Yes. Did I hear you suggest that you have another meeting already scheduled or planned to schedule with the community? 
Um, yeah, we, when, we've always intended to have a broader community meeting, um, and we're, I think we're trying to get a date at the Bank Center toward the end of June to do that for anyone who might be interested in the, in the project. Thank you. So, seeing nothing more, no more hands coming up from the council. Um, you did say that we would have a period of public comment and questions, and um, this is on the entire Community Preservation Act proposal. It's not on a specific proposal. Can I get a um, hands just so I know how many people are ask, going to be asking to speak, and we can divide the time? Okay. Um, no, no. Uh, you, they can be comments on any of the proposals or the entire. It is. Uh, I just uh, want to know how many people are going to be looking to speak roughly. Um, so, what do you think? Two minutes. So I think that we, the, the number that are, um, have raised their hands, what we'll do is we'll set it at, at a two-minute requested limit um, for public comments. And uh, I don't know, um, if they're about proposals, of course, uh, we might, um, I, I know that Mr. Bunnington has to leave, and if they do, thank you. Um, uh, your vice chair, I hope we'll be able to stay in t if, if there's any follow-up questions that you need to respond to if uh, Mr. Buddington has to go. Um, let's see, um, do we have, can I have somebody who would be willing to move the microphone around? Can you do that, Mr. Malloy? Okay, I think. Um, let's get hands again. Uh, what, what, I guess uh, right over here with you. Yes. Wow, what an honor. Um, <laughs> so my name is Johanna Newman. I live in Stanley Street in District 2. Um, and I am here, I, I volunteer with Amherst Forward. I also volunteer with the Fort River Watershed Association. And I just want to say I'm really excited about all of these CPA projects. And much like the CPA committee re voted unanimously, I hope uh, that the council also advances these projects. Um, I have three points that I was hoping to make. The first is, I really think um, this slate of projects is impressive and aligns with the values of our community, um, the ability to expand affordable housing and leverage our state assets to help secure more money from the state is really exciting. And I think the plan put forward um, yeah, is alignment with our values of making our town a place where everybody who works here can live here. Um, and, you know, it, Basically, $750,000 of our funds unleashes close to $4 million of other assets, and that seems really great to me. Um, on the conservation projects, I think we are really facing kind of a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity on some of these properties. And, um, you know, for me, access to these lands is great, but that's something we can do down the road once we actually own the properties. And, you know, the fact that these are all in areas with streams and wetlands, you know, it's just incredibly exciting. Um, so that's my first point is, I just think these projects align with our values. My second point is just about the roles and the division of responsibilities. I've been really pleased with how the conversation here has really focused on the financial aspects. Um, you know, in many ways, the question before you is not the details of the projects. We have committees that have done great work on that. But it's really, can the town afford this? And is it fiscally responsible? Um, and so I'm really pleased to see the conversation, you know, dominated by those questions and, you know, issues beyond the affordability and kind of the money pieces really belong, you know, at the CDC or at the ZBA, in particular with regard to the housing project. And then lastly, I just want to stress the urgency and the opportunity around authorizing these funds. So, you know, delaying them could have detrimental impacts. Um, construction costs for housing grow, and lack of local support could actually send signals up the pipeline that Amherst isn't committed to these projects and those, you know, resources that we're hoping to leverage would go elsewhere. So, thank you again for your time, for your service, the opportunity to comment, and I urge you to vote yes for the CPA projects. Thank you. Next. 
Hi, <coughs> excuse me, hi. My name is Dave Huber, uh, and I live at 104 Dana Street, which is it's basically 100 yards from where the Valley CDC project would go in. Um, and I just want to start off by saying that my neighbors and I, are, we're, we're not sort of saying not in our backyard. We're, instead, we're saying we, we have problems with this, this version of the proposal uh, given, and specifically the, the issues we see is given how residential the area is, it seems that this is too large a project. Um, and so, I mean, in terms of, you know, the, the costs, the, the question isn't whether or not the town can afford it, but whether, you know, how important is this priority uh, given, you know, the benefits we get from it versus the costs. Uh, and so our, our neighbors, uh, we've, we've started to investigate, you know, what will be the costs of this. Um, and one thing we identified, we, we contacted Amherst College, and the question posed to them was, what would happen if, uh, there start, if there were there are issues with the project, you know, interac negative interactions between Amherst College students and, and the residents, and they said what they would do is um, they would shut down the athletic fields to public access. Uh, and so currently, the public, the, we we basically have a very large public park at our disposal right there, and many members of the community use that on a daily basis, walking dogs and kids playing there. Um, and that would basically be, basically be shut down to us uh, if, this hap if this occurs. And, and you might say, well, why, why do I think there are gonna be um, any sort of negative interactions? Well, so one of my neighbors, um, just actually within the last day, I was able to obtain the police records from Northampton uh, on the Valley CDC projects. Uh, so we could see you know, what, what actually happens. Uh, and, and so this is the dispatch records for the, for the specific addresses of the five, um, the five properties, the SRO properties uh, in Northampton. And I, I went through this last night, I, I built up a, a spreadsheet. Uh, over the years, there's been 2,669 dispatch calls to those five properties. Uh, now, of course, you have to, you have to take into consideration how long, uh, that, you know, over what time period and how many people are in each of those units. And so if you, if you crunch through the numbers on that, it basically amounts to 2.3 dispatch calls for each resident each year of the, of the SROs. Uh, and so for comparison, I want you to consider how often do you personally call 911 about something. So it's, it seems it's a much higher sort of rate of, of calls than you. Um, and so we can, we can crunch the numbers on this and say, you know, there, if there's 28 residents, that's going to amount to 65 dispatch calls per year at this location, or more than one a week. Um, and I, I mean, I, I could, you can look at these, I have the, the logs right here actually, and you can kind of go through them and see what all the calls are about. And a lot of them are medical emergencies, inclu including overdoses. Um, that's by far the largest category. Uh, then there's a lot of fire alarm calls, uh, but there are also a fair amount of disturbances and noise complaints. Uh, and there's a lot of theft and, and vandalism in the calls as well. Uh, and so the, the issues we see is, you know, given the size of this project, it's going gonna, it's gonna to severely impact the neighborhood, uh, both in terms of access to a public park uh, and in terms of these, you know, ongoing uh, noise and emergency vehicles uh, and, and possibly increased worry about theft and vandalism. Thank you. Um, Behind you, could you just pass the microphone to somebody right behind you? That? That you set the, your spreadsheet? Right, you're saying 2.3 calls for 200,000. Could you please identify yourself? Hi, I'm Susan DeGrave. I'm with the Affordable Housing Coalition. I live in Amherst. I live at Rolling Green, actually, and I, I like the diversity over at Rolling Green. Yeah, oh, this is it, okay. I just wanted to know how many, you said, you said how many years? Okay, that would be important, right? I understand your concerns. Um, I, I heard, I guess it was Tuesday when we had our meeting, I heard that there were a number of residents, you know, nearby neighbors who had come to the meeting on Tuesday, which was, I don't think it was supposed to be about this subject, so those of us in the coalition didn't know, we weren't there, but I certainly think, I find it a little bit offensive, all due respect to this gentleman, he has a right to his point of view, that homeless people are necessarily criminals and drug users. Um, I'm right now a public school teacher. 
I'm probably going to move out of Amherst because I can't afford <laughs> rolling green. I'm paying market rate. But I can tell you that my neighbors are wonderful people. They're very diverse. There's about 40 subsidized units there. And it creates a lot of pride in people to have, be living in a nice place. And uh, I, I personally think it's really important to have families there. And they, they ride their bikes around. And they're just like everybody else. They have little cookouts and so forth. Um, I also, before becoming a public school teacher, I teach foreign language. I was a lawyer for 25 years down in Springfield, and I had a number of clients who were able to get a little key and go into a studio apartment, and believe me, they wouldn't have done anything to disturb that because it was such a huge, life-changing event for them. And yes, they had had their problems, but it didn't mean they were planning to go out and victimize other people or disturb the public park where people are walking their dogs. Um, I think this is, this is very disturbing, you know, sort of, I read the letter, the seven-page letter, and I just, that the, the, the uh, neighbors had put out, and I, I just thought, wow, this is, the neighbors and the uh, entity is going to have to come together and have a meeting, because there's a lot of fears and things that I think could be, you know, worked out, but I, I really, um, I know we only have two minutes, I had written down one other thing I wanted to say, which was, um, I've got to find my, my paper here, sorry. Um, you know, for the gentleman to say, it, how important is this priority? I think it's very important. I, I know a lot of people who are on the verge of homelessness here because of the, the rents. And uh, like I said, I probably will be moving out myself. It's just too expensive. Um, even though I'm a teacher, a public school teacher, I'm not rich by any means. So that's my two cents. <laughs> Thank you. Anybody else? Hi, um, I'm Amanda Robertson. Uh, I'm sort of a neighbor to this project. I'm relatively close, and I just wanted to comment on the last comment. There are different types of affordable housing projects. I think to compare this one to Rolling Green is a false equivalency. Um, I'm not sure. SROs are a very tricky type of affordable project, housing project to maintain, manage, I think that the community's overall concern is not a not in my backyard type of mentality, which I personally find very offensive. It is more the scope of this project, the support services provided to the residents who are a vulnerable and at risk group of individuals. And to sort of sugarcoat it and pretend, not pretend, but to sort of gloss over that as though that's not an issue, I think the, um, statistic from the Northampton Police Department on other SROs and what we do know about the comorbidity of mental health issues, addiction, and homeless populations. It's a reality. And for the community to not, to be sort of antagonized for sort of saying, wait, we'd like to know some more information about this before we proceed, I think is naive. I think that it's lumping all affordable housing initiatives into one sort of they're all different, and this is very different than what they have run before in terms of scope and what Amherst has. So I would just like to point that out in terms of saying that we don't want affordable housing. It's specific questions with regards to this plan, not affordable housing overall in the town. Excuse me, before you pass the mic over, would you please state your name and your address? Amanda Robertson, 39 Northampton Road. Thank you. My name is Hallie Hughes. I live at 30 Orchard Street. I'm not opposed to this project. What has been really frustrating, I think, is being labeled as a not in my backyard. And also, we have repeatedly reached out to Valley CDC to meet. We actually had a meeting. Two community members had a meeting scheduled with Valley CDC this Wednesday, and they abruptly canceled. What's been really hard for me, and I'm actually also an attorney. I worked in probate and family court represented kids for a long time, and I know the diverse population we have. I did my honors cl clinic in housing court in Springfield, so I actually kind of know stuff about this. What's been frustrating is the lack of notice we've had about some of these things. So we got a letter dated April 10th about this that just vaguely said that there would be a community meeting about affordable housing. There was no information about the scope of the project I wasn't even going to go, I'm going to butter, until somebody else reached out to me and said, just so you know, this is about a 28 to 32 SRO residence. 
we thought it was just like a, a couple, like a two or three family house that was going to be built, or even something like the E Street development, which is multi-units. You know, you have some studios, you have some other things. Anyway, the lack of notice has been really upsetting to me. And then I was informed this morning that Valley CDC has a whole rebuttal to the concerns we shared at the meeting on April 24th that no one has shared with the people who were at the meeting. So, I mean, Valley CDC collected our email addresses at the meeting. They've created this document addressing our concerns and haven't shared it with us. They've canceled meetings. And you're a good organization. I'm not saying you do bad things, but I'm going to ask the town finance committee to delay funding because I think there are some real important concerns that should be shared w among the community and the stakeholders before they get the funds because essentially, as we heard earlier, getting the funds is kind of a blanket approval from the town. And after they have the approval, the town council doesn't have as much input into the project. Sorry, I think I went over. Oh, it should be on. Okay. Uh, Barbara Graben Wilbur, 126 Northampton Road, right next door to the planned um, project. That place was the carriage house for our house. So it's interesting that the historic preservation was presented, and our house built in 1880. and built by a faculty member, a dean at Amherst College, and the carriage house. But interesting enough, also, their son drowned at Hickory Ridge at one of those lakes there when he was swimming. So it's kind of interesting that both those have. But that aside, I agree that the plans should be delayed. The university, Amherst College, there is a resource here that perhaps they could invest in having somebody do some more research on SROs and the sustainability, not only of them, but the actual impact on the clients or tenants or the people that live there. One comment you made about families, I agree, family situations and diversity is excellent. Having single, perhaps, and maybe you guys know what percentages of gender, what percentage of race that you're sort of anticipating will fill that. But if it, my sense is it'll be both, mostly male. It just doesn't seem like it's the type of place that would facilitate diversity and family atmosphere and that kind of thing. So that's my two cents. Uh, hi, Carol Lewis, 21 Ward Street. Um, I strongly support uh, the studio apartment project um, it, 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 for one thing, it seems to me from what I know, which is not everything, about all of the documents Amherst has created about what it's trying to do, this is exactly what it's trying to do. This is exactly the kind of, a kind of housing that we don't have at all anywhere in Amherst. And this seems like a way to put it somewhere where, yes, it's across the street from something of a neighborhood, but there are already a lot of, uh, homes or residents of some sort, some including dormitories with lots of people in them in that neighborhood already. Um, and from my own experience, I, I would like to say that living at, a, and this is an Amherst goal, is to create housing that is mixed income because, because otherwise we just perpetuate ghettos. As someone pointed out the other day, the the discrepancy or the difference between the median income of renters in Amherst and homeowners in Amherst, for instance, is huge, bigger than almost anywhere else in Massachusetts, I believe. And so having places where people with different life experiences and incomes can be in the same place at the same time is important and, and educational. When I lived in Pomeroy Lane Co-op, there was mixed income, mixed ability, all those things were in that project. And what I, I learned so much about living in community and connections I made there are with me today. And uh, we need more opportunities like that in Amherst and this can be one of them. Um, and I guess there have been statements now about why it would make sense to delay this. 
but I don't, I think that it, there's an urgency in having the town commit to the project now so that it can go forward enough to even figure out what's going to happen next. Much can be decided at, at the ZBA about the details of it. That's, I understand that's what the usual process is. Um, I don't know. The other thing, for, just for as my understanding about how the financial impact is, this building will actually so increase the value of the building that's there now that there will be a positive uh, revenue to the town from real estate taxes, and there's not any particular reason that I'm aware of to think that other expenses, the maintenance as, as uh, Valley CDC has explained, will be taken care of by them. There's not some ongoing cost that the town is going to have to pay. So besides providing for all kinds of people, and I guess another thing I want to say is that the majority of these places are for people who are working, who live, who want, who either do and can't stay, or who want to be able to live in Amherst when they're here working and doing the jobs that we need them to do and they want a place to live. Um, so I don't, I, I strongly urge the Finance Committee to recommend this project promptly um, and the Town Council to promptly vote on it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Kate Sims, 77 Dana Street. Uh, I'd like to speak to urge the town councilors to delay the project until there's a chance for meaningful input by the neighborhoods most affected by the project. Um, to quote the 2016 Town of Amherst Housing Production Plan, sorry to sound like a broken record, but um, a lot of people, I think, at this meeting weren't at the previous meeting. Uh, the Town of Amherst Housing Production Plan states, it will be important to continue to be sensitive to community concerns and to provide opportunities for residents to not only obtain accurate information on housing issues, whether they relate to zoning or new development, but have genuine opportunities for input. Um, the concern of neighbors is largely about process, that neighbors didn't hear details of the project until Valley CDC's presentation on the 24th, uh, which was after the $500,000 in CPA funding was recommended to CPAC. Um, and in order to have, it, it seems like this is the moment for genuine opportunities for input and for a productive dialogue where we could work together to figure out some really great solutions um, to meet some of the town's goals and to um, have this, this be you know, a really good project moving forward. Um, and so I, I think my question is to the, to the council and to Valley CDC, you know, are, are you open to alternatives such as family-oriented affordable housing such as a smaller size for the project, such as a parcel swap with Amherst College for a different piece of land along 116 or along Route 9. Amherst College owns tremendous uh, amounts of land along, both, along that corridor, uh, well, along both of those corridors, along the 116 corridor and along the Route 9 corridor down to College Street. Um, and perhaps some of those parcels would not uh, pose the conflict with open space that, that this project could, could risk. Um, so, I ask for delay because it seems like this is the moment for that meaningful input and productive conversation to occur. And um, uh, the councillor uh, Greismeyer, sorry, I don't know how to pronounce your last name, um, mentioned that she was working on a, a forum for that type of productive input. And so it would be helpful to hear an update from the council as well as to hear from Valley CDC what types of alternatives are, are they open to. Thank you. Chris, hold on. We have another person back here. Hello, John Page. I am a resident of Amherst, currently at 96 North Prospect Street, but I'll actually be moving in District 3, but moving in District 2 very soon. <laughs> I had some information about financials, but that doesn't seem to be where the conversation is going, so I will highlight a few things. This project has been discussed in public meetings for approximately 16 to 18 months. It will be for another three years. So in terms of public process, I hope that we take that timeline into account. Additionally, this is just the beginning of a long process. This is just the start. And the question before the council is not who will these people be. In fact, we've already mentioned their sex, what their family dynamic might be, 
Also, how they might be paying for it, whether it's a voucher, you know, Section 8, whether it's VA, Department of Mental Health. All of those things are criteria that we can't even discuss in the context of this project. The real question before us today is the financial impact, so we should really be focusing on that. And then there will be opportunities in the future. Valley is required to hold certain meetings, and they will, and that will be the opportunity. Issues of size and shape and physical logistics of the project, that is an issue for the Zoning Board of Appeals several months down the line from now, too, if we pass this phase. So there are many opportunities for public input. This is just the beginning, and there already has been a lot, and I guess I'm thankful for that. I do want to respond uh, not to specifically the request, but following our financial um, finance committee hearing, I guess it was on Tuesday evening, uh, the town manager and I have discussed the a follow-up meeting and actually this is the first time I've had an opportunity to reach out to the Valley CDC people and look for a, a mutually agreeable date for both them and people who advocate and people who are concerned and people from the town who bring a lot of knowledge and try to figure out the correct form in which we can have that conversation. But it is still on the books. I don't know how much time I have left, but in terms of research, I think it's worth noting that there's a few experts in this community that have already weighed in. Um, in terms of the Amherst Survival Center, Craig's Doors Homeless Shelter, the Interfaith Housing Corporation, the Amherst Housing Authority, the Amherst Municipal Affordable Housing Trust have written about this project, have thought about this project. So if we're looking for research and information, perhaps we should look towards those people who are both experts and in our community. So, is there anyone, anyone else who had their hands up or Chris? I must confess I didn't raise my hand in the beginning, but okay. I would like to speak for a few moments now. I'm Chris Brestrup, Planning Director for the Town of Amherst, and I just wanted to share some thoughts in support of this project. This project has been around for quite a while. In fact, it first uh, came to light probably in the early part of 2017. Um, there's been a long-standing need for housing for low-income people and for homeless people in Amherst. Um, we've recognized that for years. Craig's Doors opened its doors about seven years ago, and this year alone they housed 172 individuals. In July of 2016, the town held a forum in this room, and there were over 100 people here, many people sitting on the floor and standing in the back, to hear about issues related to homelessness in Amherst. Um, it was brought to the attention of the town by many entities, including churches and others who serve homeless people, but also even the Business Improvement District was concerned about the issue. So people came together and talked about how to address the issue of homelessness and low-income housing. The town has been successful over the years in providing and encouraging uh, housing for uh, low-income people. We've had Olympia Oaks up in North Amherst with 42 units and Butternut Farms down in South Amherst with 28 units. And I could go on and on to list projects that the town has been supportive of to support low-income people and their housing needs. The master plan also contains many uh, statements with regard to um, our goals and objectives for housing for low-income people, among which are encourage the development of economic economically diverse neighborhoods. Partner with local community development corporations, nonprofit organizations, and other groups to expand affordable housing in Amherst. Improve housing and services for people in the area who are homeless. And increase the amount of housing available to people of very low incomes. And we really have very few um, housing opportunities for people of very low incomes. The location is a good one. It's on a busy connector road and within walking distance of bus stops. The project is within walking distance of downtown Amherst as well as uh, the, the shopping areas on University Drive. Um, there are going to be pedestrian and bicycle improvements made to this stretch of Northampton Road, Route 9, which will make it easier for people to 
walk up and down the street, and also to bicycle. The project makes sense in terms of infill. Um, our, our master plan states that we try to uh, develop in areas that are already developed and to preserve as much as possible the wonderful open space that we have around us. And there's a history to this project. Valley CDC has been talking to Amherst about this type of project for several years. Valley CDC went through an extensive uh, research proje project where they looked at properties throughout town and for various reasons, because of cost, location, or suitability, they decided against those other properties. A few years ago, Valley CDC discussed a possible Northampton Road location, not a specific location, but just mentioned the fact that Northampton Road would be a good location. And they discussed this with the Amherst Homeless Systems Group and the Amherst Municipal Housing Trust. Amherst has already given support to this project in the form of $50,000 for assessments and feasibility studies to identify sites. And in January, Valley CDC came to the zoning subcommittee and presented their supportive housing model to the zoning subcommittee and explained that there were issues with our zoning bylaw that might prevent them from doing what they had hoped to do, which was to provide supportive housing for individuals. In the spring of 2017, Amherst annual town meeting voted overwhelmingly in favor of a zoning amendment that will, would allow an apartment building to be built with only one size units, and that would be this type of, of building with uh, only studio apartments. Um, in addition, the master plan, uh, I wanted to bring this up, this is a sort of an addition to my uh, <laughs> statement here, that, but the master plan encourages development in areas that are already developed, but it also encourages development for, um, for people, for, well, this is in response to something that was said by somebody else. Um, it encourages uh, uh, housing for all kinds of people, including families and individuals. And in this case, we um, are being faced with a, pro a project that would provide housing for individuals. In another case, namely East Street School, that would provide housing for families. So we have two opportunities here for different types of individuals. So I urge you to support this project. I think it's a good project. It really um, meets a lot of the goals and objectives of Amherst Master Plan and many of the things that we've been talking about for years about helping uh, to house homeless and low-income people. Okay, thank you. Um, I think I have to uh, get to the end of public comment because it's already um, of the amount of time that's gone on. Um, but if you can say something in one minute, then I'll let you conclude co public comment. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for letting me cap this off. Um, my name's Amy Gilbert Loinez. I live at 14 Orchard Street, uh, just two houses away from the proposed residence. And I just wanted to say I appreciate that there's been a lot of discussion over the last um, few years on this project. I think that the fact that we as the neighbors to this new residence didn't really know the details until the April 24th meeting. And since then, I've just been trying to do research and understand the impact on our neighborhood. Although it has been in discussion, and town meeting did, did approve the uh, zoning change to make it um, this kind of housing possible, I think we deserve time to understand its impact on our neighborhood. And that's not a minor thing. You know, we, we live right there. It's, it's going to affect us, and we want to be comfortable with the idea and understand as many facts as possible um, before um, going forward. And so we, we ask for a delay in the vote. Thank you. Okay. So um, let me see. I'm going to turn back to the council in just a moment to see if there are any follow-up uh, last comments on this because we do have other items we have to consider. I just, But I do want to just also say a couple things about the next processes. Um, so everybody understands the um, charter requires that the Finance Committee provide a report to the council by June 3rd on the proposed budget. The proposed budget actually includes the operating budget and the capital budget. It does not encompass um, the Community Preservation Act a proposal, which is actually separate from the budget. It will be a separate vote. So our next meeting on May 28th, we may discuss this some, the, the CPA proposal some, 
but our focus will need to be on the report that we are required by the Charter to provide to the Council by June 3rd. Um, I mentioned capital. That's going to be the other part of this. After uh, We'll take a break in a couple of minutes, and then after the break, we're going to um, spend a little bit of time to um, he, um, get any questions from the councilors present about the uh, capital plan that's proposed for the next year, um, because that's a part of next week's uh, discussion and the report that needs to be delivered on June 3rd. Uh, Beyond that, um, we, uh, the council, uh, the committee will make have a meeting and make recommendations regarding the financial considerations for the CPA proposals, and um, get that also to the council in an expeditious manner. Um, other th two other meetings that I'll mention, and I'm going to turn it to, to um, the president to see if she has anything she wants to add to what I'm just saying is that um, the council itself is required to have a forum to discuss the capital budget, which has uh, been put noticed and posted for June 10. And um, I believe that the council anticipates uh, consideration on all budget matters on June 17, whether it can postpone any or chooses uh, to postpone any portion of any uh, of the CPAC proposal is a matter that would ultimately be a council decision um, initially made by the president. Uh, so let me just mention, as we've been looking at the budget process and our two meetings scheduled in June, on June 3rd, uh, we will focus predominantly on the general um, operating budget, the schools, and the library. We then have the opportunity one week later for the, here, the forum on capital that Mr. Steinberg mentioned. And so we want to make sure that we have both the Finance Committee's recommendation and that forum in our vision, if you will, and so then on the 17th of June is when we will focus as a council on capital projects. As, um, the, um, as Andy mentioned, the issue of we will need to take up those CPA projects and any other projects that have an impact on allocation of funds for this year and setting the tax rate. Uh, but if we delay a project, we can do that. But take it up within a month or less, even less, if that. So that's generally the schedule for the council. Uh, we do have to, by law, have a budget in place by June 30th so that we can continue to operate. Thank you. So, yes, Pat. I, I just have a question about what would the date of the meeting be um, to discuss the CPAC? We have not set that. I'm hoping to communicate with uh, the CDC people and also uh, our voting on it would probably not be until the 17th as a council. Yes, yes as a council. Anything else? So um, then I uh, think it probably appropriate um, that we'll take a five-minute break at this point and then reconvene, at which point we are going to be discussing the um, Joint Capital Planning Committee recommendations, and uh, which will be the principal additional part of uh, the agenda for today.
excuse, excuse me, but we're going to reconvene our meeting. Okay, um, we're reconvening the meeting, and I'm uh, uh, now I ask uh, Mr. Mangano to uh, uh, make the initial presentation that he's prepared on the capital plan proposal, uh, which was also one of the items that was uh, sent to the um, council with the budget package. Hello, everyone. So I was telling Sonia that this is very similar to school committee, which when I get ready to give my presentation, everybody in the room leaves. Um, <laughs> it's, it's not unusual for me, so don't feel bad. I'm, I'm, I'm used to this. Um, so before I get into the presentation, I, I want to- do know that the council's still here. Yes, I appreciate that. In fact, there's more of you. Um, yeah, so thank you, Sonia. So I wanted to thank um, all the department heads who spent a lot of time preparing their requests for the JCPC. A lot goes into uh, putting packets of information for every project, getting all the back, um, backup detail that goes into that. Um, I also wanted to thank the members of JCPC for all the, the time that they spent. And in particular, I wanted to thank Sonia and Anthony because they put a lot of logistical hours into making it all work and getting things posted online and um, putting all the, the spreadsheets together and, and making everything work. So in front of you, it sounds like you got, had this email to you as well, but you'll have the uh, report of the Joint Capital Planning Committee. Um, thank you, Mr. Seinberg, for putting that together. It does a good job of capturing the history of the Joint Capital Planning Committee, um, describing the issues that we dealt with throughout this process, and it gives a, a sort of short synopsis of every recommended project. Um, so I'm gonna touch on some of the highlights of those things, um, go over the summary of the projects that were recommended and touch on the themes, um, and then eventually turn it over to you for questions and feedback. So Joint Capital Planning Committee uh, in Amherst uh, was founded or created in 1992. I think it's really one of like the uh, strategic advantages that Amherst has is that we have this really good cross collaboration um, between departments in Amherst where you have different boards and committees coming together to review all the capital needs together. Um, this committee reviews all the capital requests that come in from the various town departments. Um, I'll have a list of them in a second. And basically prioritizes the, the needs of the town. Um, compares that to the funding that's available and, and ultimately makes a recommendation to the town manager. This year, um, as you'll probably have some questions on, we had a unique challenge of sort of a shortened process because of the, the change in the form of government, um, working through some hiccups that came up along the way, um, but we also have a plan to sort of get some feedback and, and try to take active steps to improve the process for next year. So as I said, the, the general process is that each department submits uh, a, a request packet to JCPC for any projects for the upcoming year um, that they want to be considered. Um, the Capital Planning Committee has a hearing with each of those departments and, and the committee, uh, the department head, makes the case for all their projects. Um, you can see the different departments around the circle. I think that covers just about all of them. Sorry if I missed anybody. Um, but basically, you know, there's these packets that the committee gets and has all the backup information. Um, JCPC will ask a lot of questions to uh, basically analyze the validity of the re requests, um, see if it needs to be done this year, if it could be pushed off, um, is it uh, really the best option to go forward, um, and they get that, that feedback from the department head. And then ultimately, JCPC looks at all the projects together and develops a priority uh, list based on the available funding. Uh, JCPC also hears from two other entities during the process besides department heads. Um, they get feedback during the process from the town manager because even though they make a recommendation to the town manager, uh, it's good for them to hear sort of what he's looking for so that they don't recommend something that's completely out of whack with sort of his uh, principles for this, this budget cycle. Um, and there's also a citizen request process. So I think it's two years old, um, but and it had, this is one of the hiccups that we have to work out, uh, but there is a mechanism for citizens to submit requests to JCPC and then to come make their case directly to JCPC for why that request should be funded. Um, and so the, the nice thing this year is actually two of those citizen requests are built in um, to the recommendation. 
um, and I'll touch on those when we get to the, the project listing. So um, they hear all the requests, JCPC, and then starts looking at the available funding along the way. Um, the major sources of funds that JCPC has to um, consider is the 9.5% of the tax levy. That's the sort of discretionary portion of the, the capital planning committee's funds that we've been trying to grow every year. I think probably several years ago it was about five or 6%, and it's, we've grown it, I think, half a percent every year um, over the past several years. Uh, in addition, there are uh, Chapter 90 funds, which come from the state, and are specifically for road work. Um, there are grants that come up at times, um, private donations, and things of that nature. Um, so that's on the revenue side. On the expense side, uh, we start with the existing and projected general, uh, general fund debt from the prior year. So sort of like the discussion with CPA, um, there's an amount of funds that have already been committed by projects that were approved in prior years. And so we take our total available funding, and we have to start by reducing that by the debt that's already obligated for projects um, that have been approved already. And then whatever's left over is available to approve the current year's requests. Um, and as you can see in the scale, this is symbolic, that typically the requests always outweigh the available funds. And so some prioritization is needed. Um, all the projects that are recommended by JCPC have a funding source identified. So uh, the smaller projects are typically in that orange um, box, or the small to medium sized projects, uh, what we call cash capital. So that just means we pay for it all at once. It's not a multi-year payment plan. Um, if there's another, another funding source, like a grant or a private donation, again, it'll be paid all at once, but it'll be paid from a different source. Um, and then larger projects, typically, we borrow for. Um, and again, just like the CPA presentation, um, it's not a drain on that year's resources for capital, but eventually the debt schedule impacts the future year's resources for capital. So we do have to monitor how many projects are being approved for borrowing um, to make sure that we're not um, taking away too much funding from future years. Um, con project considerations. So when department heads submit their requests, you know, they're asked to identify what is the, the uh, driving force behind those requests. And some of these you know, have higher priorities than others. So the, the major factors that we look for are, is it a request based on safety, um, something that could be a, a, a risk to the community or to the residents? Um, asset maintenance and improvement, are we preserving an asset that's starting to deteriorate and could become a more costly item? Uh, is it legally required? There's various laws that change and sometimes require a, a investment. Um, a good example of that is with schools and really with any building that has um, this certain type of refrigerant that has been basically discontinued, so we're not going to be able to get that refrigerant anymore. Um, we're going to have to buy, uh, upgrade our chiller systems in the future um, to take a different refrigerant. Uh, infrastructure improvement, like roads, sidewalks. Productivity improvement, um, new copiers, uh, machinery that might make uh, somebody in the DPW's job um, uh, more productive and newly identified needs, something that we didn't know about before, and then relationship to long-term planning objectives. So I think there's a master plan that has several obje objectives in it, and some of the requests relate to those objectives. So that whole process comes together, um, and we have several meetings, and ultimately this is the, the final product. These are the, the projects broken down into three buckets that is, are the standard buckets at the JCPC um, uses, and I'm not going to go through all of them, but I'll highlight some of the themes. Um, so on this list, just for uh, orientation, so if it has a light gray shading, that means it's being uh, proposed through a borrowing. If it has that bluish color, it means there's another uh, funding source available. Uh, yellow is the Chapter 90 money from the state, and like that light blue, which sort of looks gray. Um, is a grant, so the housing production plan is the only one that falls into that bucket. And then everything else is proposed to be cash capital, so things that would be purchased outright um, going forward. I would say there's probably three themes, or there's probably other ones, but these are, these are the themes that I take away from this. Um, roads and sidewalks was a theme from the beginning that we knew about. We've heard a lot from the community, from the town manager, that we really need to maintain that investment in roads and sidewalks. Um, and you'll see over on the right, under facilities, that the road repairs is at a million. I think that's either the same as last year or maybe a little bit higher than last year. Um, and then uh, the sidewalks are up to 200,000. It says around town, but should say sidewalks. I don't know why it says around town. Um, but that's sidewalks around town. 
Um, so roads was definitely a major theme. Um, the schools, I know you've all heard a lot about the schools. Um, the schools spent a lot of time thinking about their requests because of, you know, obviously the possibility of a new building in the future and how do we request funds to keep our buildings safe and, and um, you know, a good climate for our students and staff, but also we don't want to sink any costs if we're going to have a new building sometime in the next five to ten years. Um, so you can see there's a lot of requests there for the schools to, to help um, basically do that. Um, and then the third thing I would say is this plan also sort of inches the sort of the larger capital planning around new buildings forward. So there's in the gray at the bottom of the, the building section, there's, there's um, further development of three building projects. So there's money for schematic design for public works facility, uh, schematic design work for the fire department, um, potential funding for a uh, feasibility study for the new elementary school if we get into the MSBA. Um, and even below that, I'll point out the preliminary feasibility for the Crocker Farm study. That's one of the citizen requests that was approved. Um, there was a good case made for studying could Crocker Farm be expanded in the future to, to house more students um, and what that would cost. And so that was approved for this year. Or not approved, sorry, recommended. Uh, this is part of this plan. Um, so those are the three themes. Um, and maybe I'll stop now and see if there's any questions on projects that have been recommended for FY20. Let me just mention from the council, the three people on JCPC are Mandy Joe and myself and Andy who chaired JCPC. And then I want to recognize the fact that I think Kathy would, that was at every one of our meetings as yes, well. Yes, Kathy was the ad hoc member. So, <laughs> and she regularly did her public comment and questions. And then in addition to that, there's two people from the schools and two people from the library. And those are the people that met Thursdays, I guess, for, I don't know, six, seven, eight weeks, whatever. Yeah, we're not done. I think we just scheduled another meeting, right? So. <laughs> yeah, the, uh, we do have one more meeting scheduled for uh, June 6th, and the purpose of that meeting is we want to revisit the entire process and make recommendations for how we envision um, the process moving forward. This, as with everything that the council has done, was a transition year. We did the best we could to get through the first year, and we want to take time to assess how we did and what we do differently. Yes. Um, I now have this uh, chart on my computer where I can read it, and I'm looking at there's on my computer it's two different grays. One is borrowing, and the other is grants. Mm -hmm. But I think it's supposed to be two different colors. Yeah, on my computer one was bluer than okay. how it appears. The only one that's a grant. Um, is the housing production plan. All the other ones are grays, or are, are borrowings. Are, are, are borrowing. Are borrowings, yep. The okay. only one that's a grant on up here is the housing production plan. Yeah, uh, that's kind 000. of bluish, yeah, okay. Thank you. Yep. Okay. So again, while people are thinking all these projects, um, again, we heard pr presentations on just about every one of these, I believe. Um, and they were vetted by JCPC um, pretty extensively, lots of uh, meetings and, and time spent on all of these. Um, <coughs> and I, you know, my experience, this was my ex first year really being deeply involved with JCPC, but a lot of good questions, really challenging department heads to make the case for why these projects are important. I guess the last, uh, one additional thing that I'd uh, point out is that if you look at the actual JCPC report that was provided to members of the council, um, a little bit more information is provided on each of these uh, beginning on page seven. And, uh, but again, we're, we're for focusing on the FY20 recommended projects. Um, yes, Kathy. Okay. Um I have a question on our process on FY20 um, compared to the 10 years mm -hmm. um, sheet. So when we are considering the budget that we did the other night um, and looking at the operating budget and the pieces, and then we're doing this, will we be just considering this part of the capital budget? Because some of my questions are potentially more related to thinking longer term, uh, like those of you who look to FY21, FY20 looks great, but FY21 has a $6 million deficit, as does every year after, so it's an interesting plan, if we want to call it a plan. 
Um, and part of that, I think, were good decisions for FY20, where we went up on roads and we went up on sidewalks, but we pushed things into FY21 to do that. That are, and then we're starting to get the big buildings. So it's, are we just, you know, so we're just for purposes of what we're going to be making a recommendation on finance and then the council is going to be voting on is just FY20, correct? That is correct. Okay. So then my, my second question um, is it's the interaction with CPA. So we're showing CPA as a source because they're in our debt when we're, so, so yeah. they, they send the money over to this budget accounting as a source, and so some of that debt service that we have down in the other line is an exact match, right? So I, okay, so then my last question on understand this. If we allocate in this year, or if we allocated in last year, and it didn't all get spent, so say the school's got a certain amount to do repairs on the building, and you looked at June 30th, mm -hmm. um, do they still hold on to the money? Is the accounting system that that money is still sitting there? Yeah, so if, the, if it's not spent but the need remains, then the funds stay there and they can be spent in future years. If, if they're not spent and the need goes away, they get closed out. And it goes back, I think, into a, a, a unused article money that basically eventually gets reappropriated through this process. Um, which is, Do I think, for example, so like the protective gear, correct me if I'm wrong, um, Sonia, the protective gear, other funding source, is a reappropriation of um, articles that have been closed out. So do, do we go back and look, so, you know, things like when we were hearing the school roof is leaking, yep. if in earlier years, if I look back, there were patches for the roof, yep. it, it could still happen, this, you know, there's some things that are ongoing that some repairs could be made that aren't all in the FY20 budget. Yeah, Sonia yells at me once in a while. Um, to look at old articles and, and, <laughs> and close them out if they're not going to be spent. So Sonia, Sonia is pretty good at staying on top of people that if, if there are old, old articles, she, are they going to be spent soon? Um, and if not, to let them know that they can be closed out. Yes. Um, I'm looking at the borrowing and I'm seeing right here, it's one point, approximately 1.5 million. Mm -hmm. Is that, how does that stand with what you've done in the past? Um, so I can't speak so much to the past, but most of these um, borrowings are fluid, I would say. So for example, the fiber optic INET, um, that one's not gonna be next year, correct? That, we think that's 21. Was there a, an offset in the funding for that some, from something? We have four hundred and fifty thousand dollars um, from the Comcast um, contract that we entered into last year. Yeah, that will be used to pay debt service on this. Right. So, so my point with that one is, so that's showing up here because we have to put the full amount for the debt authorization purpose eventually. Um, but there's a when we actually start paying that debt, there may be another funding source that covers it. Um, and then the only other debt items on here are the the new building projects, um, which. I, in terms of how it compares to prior years, I'm not quite sure. Um, I don't think it's, I think there's always some level of borrowing in each cycle. Um, and our debt, we know, is sort of winding down. So as a town, we don't have a lot of debt um, right now. We may in the future. Um, but we know it's winding down. So n these amounts are related to those building projects that we're planning for. And the amounts that are in the full, um, we updated the amounts that are in the full 10-year plan to, um, in terms of the new building projects to be consistent with our um, most recent estimates, uh, basically. So, so that's part of that estimate. And, and when we approve the budget, those, for example, in the DPW fire station and the new school, we will only do that borrowing if we're going to go forward with those projects. For example, if we find land for DPW, then that's the schematic design. That allows us also to go forward on fire. And the school actually will sit there until December when we find out whether or not we get the MSBA school thing. Yeah, yeah. and correct me if I'm wrong, Sonia, all the gray ones, won't. none of that borrowing will actually happen until it comes back to the town council to be authorized. So they'll come back to you at some point. 
Right. Um, we won't be asking you to vote on those borrowings in this cycle. It'll be off cycle when we're, we have uh, more firm numbers on some of these. That's one of the benefits of the new form of government is that we can bring it to you throughout the year. Andy? So I, I just wanted to yeah. clarify why they're on here then, or at, le at least the three, the three building ones. The JCPC felt it important to start putting that potential borrowing into something we as a council could see, even though it might not be voted on immediately, just for planning purposes. But, but it would be out of FY, yep. it would be done during FY20, so it needs to be encompassed and envisioned as, as part of the FY20 bud, uh, capital budget. Yeah, Evan? I think this is a question for more for the committee. Um, so it, my read, and I'm trying to remember because the capital plan was one of the shorter budget documents, so I read it first, <laughs> so it's been a while. Um, there were a number of citizen requests that were put in. Uh, one you mentioned was the Crocker Farm study. There was another, I think, the sidewalk, which I yeah. don't see, but I assume it's built into one of these DPW things. Mm -hmm. um, how did you all go about choosing re which resident requests you fund? And then the other part that was really interesting to me, and I'd love to hear a little bit more about, is that the cost is suggested by the proponents. Is that correct? And is that, how does that work? <laughs> yeah, um, actually it's a good question because this is something that's evolving. Uh, a couple of years ago, uh, JCPC decided that it would be um, important and valuable to allow citizens to say, hey, we think that this ought to be done. We had no idea, JCPC at the time had no idea whether it was going to come in with uh, need a new playground or need, new, or need something done to a particular street or whatever, but that there needed to be some mechanism that not all capital requests would come through town departments. Um, and since then, uh, JCPC for the last two years has been trying to improve the process and make it so that it is very um, real and therefore meaningful. Uh, in the first year, nothing was funded uh, and there was no real process. Uh, the um, question of uh, estimating amounts, what, uh, because when uh, DPW decides that they would like to propose some new piece of equipment, they can attach a cost to it. Um, so that part of the request form had, what do you anticipate the cost to be? Uh, of course, what we're beginning to realize is that there needs to be some ability to help citizens to come to a translation of the cost on that. And that, that so it, it's part of that learning process in trying to um, make this a real process and make it uh, meaningful. The fact that we actually are to the point where um, some of them are being funded, I think is um, movement in the direction that was considered, um, and I think that obviously if at some point the council says, oh, wait a minute, this doesn't make sense, we'd like to hear that too. But JCPC is trying to do that. That was sort of its decision that it wanted to make, make it a more open process than just town staff. Uh, also, each of the people that proposed these came and made a presentation to JCPC. And then there was a formal or informal process by which what they were proposing, there was a check back with the department that it was mostly associated with. So for example, the feasibility for Crocker Farm directly relates to the school, whole school building plan. And that, you know, so it was like turning to the schools and saying, Boy, is this a reasonable thing? And you know, there's a part of them that says, "Yeah, if we move forward, it's reasonable." 
Yeah, and on the, the Crocker Farm one, just because I remember this conversation, um, they proposed it at 40. There was a conversation actually with, with one of, the, I think, the architects that are working on the other, the Fort River feasibility study, um, who gave sort of a preliminary, I want to say a quote, but they gave sort of a ballpark figure. Um, it was actually lower than the 40. We decided to keep it at the 40 because the scope of what this is is still a little, still developing. So we thought to be safe, probably leave it at the higher number than what the architects said it could be, because um, it wasn't a huge difference between the two. And uh, one additional uh, request was for the North Hamish Library, and uh, that is very much still in the mix. It was placed, there's an amount that was placed into a future year for North Hamish Library so that it is by no means forgotten. And our suggestion from JCPC that hour um, was that um, uh, the petitioner, the person who had made the request, um, who also was talking about trying to um, get citizen donations, uh, would work with the town manager and uh, try and uh, um, perfect the process by working, having the petitioner work with the manager. And in addition, a lot of the requests that we get are, are that we got this year, and I, I understand last year, are for road projects. Um, and so one of the things that we uh, one of the things we have to express to the requesters is that we don't decide what roads get done. Um, there's a different committee that does that. So a lot of times, at least two or three of the projects, I think we just we deferred or we diverted uh, to the, the Transportation Advisory Council Committee. Mm -hmm. um, and so again, that's one of those parts of the process that we have to maybe upfront explain that we can't really make that decision of what roads are being done. That's, there's a different body that does that. Yes. And, and just um, on the other one, what you see, Evan, on East Pleasant Street sidewalk, last year it was a citizen request, and meanwhile, TAC had been setting priorities, and it came out to be a top priority for both DPW and TAC on the next on the list. So it's listed here, but the actual dollar amount came from DPW that said to even think of a sidewalk, we have to do a survey first, so the amount is came from them on what a survey would cost. So the citizens just came and said, sidewalk. <laughs> and sidewalks, we can't do a sidewalk for $50,000. I mean, it was, all that's in there is getting ready. So it was an interesting process to, because they were delighted to see it in, you know, but it wasn't their number that went into the budget. Okay, looking around if there's other questions. Yes, Shalini. Just a clarifying question on the citizen, uh, no, resident capital request. So is, is it it's okay if they don't know all the data? Like this stuff over there it seems very technical. Yeah, well, some, I mean, I won't speak for the committee. What I perceive is that some of the job of the JCPC is to determine how much information is known. And if there's enough there for the proposal to be recommended, then um, they do. If it seems like it still needs a lot of development, then at least this year, and this is part of improving the process, the, the citizens piece was at the end of the process. So there's not a lot of time if the, if the proposal doesn't come sort of fully vetted and fully developed um, to go back and rework it. So I think that's part of whether it gets recommended is how well developed the, the proposal is. And, and again, that might be something that in the future we look at to maybe doing it earlier in the process. Yeah, and I guess the other thing is that the form that was um, provided was the for same form that was um, used by staff from um, departments and from the schools and library, only they have the expertise as noted so that one of the observations that we've made after just beginning to experiment with it is that the form itself may not be the um, correct form to use for citizen requests. Um, but this is a learning process. Uh, we have to sort of go back to a couple of years ago. It didn't exist at all. So we're moving in a direction, hopefully, in a direction everybody thinks is the right one. Yeah, Dorothy. I have a couple of questions on uh, equipment. Um, furniture, all schools, $20,000. Uh, that doesn't sound like that could be enough. Uh, at all. Um, and also copiers. Um, 
we spend so much time in my house just dealing with our three copiers to make sure that one of them is always working. Um, are these kind of low ball figures here? Um, so the furniture, so it's not to replace all the furniture in the schools. What we try to do is request sort of a standing amount to address the needs that arise during that year. Um, so you're right, 20,000 is not enough to replace a ton of furniture, um, but it's used to prioritize the needs at the schools. Um, and the copier, let me see the copiers. Oh, you're probably, yeah. So what's the number for the copier, $11,000? Yeah. Yeah, so that, that's roughly the, the, ball, uh, the, the cost of one new copier. So we've got a, in Amherst, we've got, I think, about eight copiers. Um, Fort River and Wildwood have three each, and Crocker Farm has two, just how it worked out over time. Um, and so we've got a replacement schedule, and so it just happens that this year there's only one that is reaching that age where it needs to be replaced, and so that's one copier. Um, and when I think about furniture, though, I think about the seats in the middle school mm -hmm. um, who, that really need to be replaced. The desks? No, the, the auditorium chairs. You've got to go see it. You gotta go check it out. Has it been done? Yes. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's great. Make a, go visit. And, and do remember that the middle school is part of the region, not a part of the town, so that uh, this is actually a regional project yeah. on that one. Um, but you're right, it doesn't go incredibly far, but that's, I, I think the idea to request a small amount of furniture every year has only been, only started a few years ago. So the 20,000, I think, is actually an uptick in terms of how much we're requesting. Um, for desks and, and things like that. So you want to go on for a few minutes to the long-term plan? And... Yes. I, I have questions on it. Uh -huh. um, yep. And I've raised some of them before, but uh, to have a long-term plan, and I'm even thinking a two-year plan, mm -hmm. forget a 10-year plan, that the second year looks like our second year. So I'm just wondering as we present it, how we go out and talk about it. And then there's some interactives, and these are nuances that I can send notes on, but an example is library, where a library in uh, uh, the next year and the following year has a automatic book sorter and a RFID, mm -hmm. to, so $200,000. But if they got the grant for the building, that would be included in it. Mm -hmm. And when they came in, they said if they don't get the grant for the building, they won't buy it. Right. So I'm wondering why we still are carrying it on the books. You know, so, you know, so there's some things like why is it there if it, one way it, it's in another budget. And staying on library, the, the grant proposal, if it comes through, was supposed to be 15.9 million for the town share with another six from fundraising, and you've got 21 pegged in here with the yeah. other six in. So that's a you know. So each of these are questions on a. It doesn't look a lot better when you remove these, but trying to think of where have we put a number in that's higher than it needs be to fine tune it. And I'll go to the North Amherst Library as another example. Both the librarian said, and then the petitioner, um, that if it got the big size of the library, it wasn't feasible because they can't go up on their operating budget. Mm -hmm. So it's the smaller version that would go in. And if it was matched with citizen money, it would be still smaller. So in many of the others, we only do the most likely cost to the town. Mm -hmm. Um, so trying to think of where, when we go in out years, we can do something It's like a grant-matched fund. The permanent bridge for Station Road was supposed to be grant-funded, where it would be half of this on our budget, and it's showing up as a million. So I'm just looking for ways of getting the next four, two, three, and four, and five years down to what we know we've got a problem, but getting out some of the things where we're overestimating the, the magnitude of the problem. So, and let me just say the last thing, when I did the math, even if we take the big buildings completely out, we're three and a half million dollar deficit. Right. So if it even, it isn't new debt for, because we're building, we're three and a half in the hole. So just trying to, and I know that's hard with the town manager saying, what's next year look like when we're not, you know, two years out, but having, some decisions made. Um, so that's my question of what we want to show 
the whole town on June 10th. Okay. Um, so I'll start by saying I think one silver lining in how much, how bad it looks in terms of the out years um, is that there are a number of projects, in particular at the schools, that if the new building goes forward, those projects would come out. Um, I believe there's a roof, there's roofs in there, there's um, some windows that we want to keep on the capital plan so that everyone's aware that those are needs. Um, but if the school happens, um, then and it happens depending on when it happens, um, some of those costs will be avoided. Um, so some of this deficit, I think, will just be reduced if some of these new building projects actually happen. Um, in addition, I think we generally try to be conservative in terms of the numbers that go on here. So I agree around the estimates in many cases or could be potentially lower, but we do try to be conservative because if anything we want, when we get to that current year, we'd rather the numbers come down instead of going the other way. So I'm not saying that explains everything that you identified, but um, in general, that's sort of the way we lean. Um, and I think the last <coughs> thing I'll say is, and I, and I um, have to do this as well, which is I think we need to refocus when we do the department head request a lot of times the you know, 90% of the time is spent on the coming year requests and maybe 10% of the time is spent tweaking the out years. Um, and I think for the next cycle, we maybe need to re-remind department heads to really, including myself um, in the schools, to really focus on the out years um, because we're gonna have difficult decisions to make in the future um, and trying to fine tune um, the, the, the out years on this plan, which, which is very challenging, right, to go out, you know, more than, really more than two or three years, um, but to do our best to fine tune that. Um, is, is going to be important. So, uh, there's another, I'll just go through this quickly. Does everyone feel oriented toward, to how this document works? Or do you want a quick, okay. So in general, the way this works really quickly, sources are at the top. Um, those are the revenue sources that we're projecting going forward. The capital spending is all the projects that have been proposed in out years um, in that middle section. And then those two gray lines at the bottom show the, the deficit um, basically between the requests and what's available um, at two different levels. If we allocate 9.5% of the tax levy towards capital, um, that's the, the top, uh, the one that looks worse. This, the, the first FY21 is 6.7 million uh, deficit. And if we allocate 10% of the tax levy, which is sort of the plan is to keep creeping that up five, uh, half a percent every year, it gets a little bit better because there's more funding available for capital. Um, so this is the summary sheet. This is sort of the, the highlights of looking out. Um, and, I, and I'll defer to um, Sonia, but this looks bad, but I think it generally has always, we, again, the requests are always greater than the, um, the sources. And, and that's why we have this process to try to, to match up what we have available and what we can actually spend. And then this is just broken, the, the actual projects are all listed here. It's broken down into those three buckets, um, equipment, buildings, and facilities. And then within each of those buckets, it's broken down into different functional areas, town hall, town clerk, police, fire, um, schools, and so on. Um, so if you're interested in what's you know, planned for the out years, this is where um, you can look. And you can also see in here if something's been moved from one year to the next, it's color-coded by fiscal year. So if um, if you see something red that's in the green column under FY21, like this, for example, it means it was originally requested for FY20, um, but through the capital planning process, it was pushed off a year um, or deferred a year. So you can get a sense of a little bit just by looking at this, how the conversations have gone um, at the committee level. Um, and the color coding around funding sources also is in this document. So if it's gray, it's proposed to be a borrowing, um, yellow, proposed to be Chapter 90 funds, if there's other funding sources that's also highlighted here. Um, and again, part of our process for next year, and, and we welcome your input, is reviewing this document as well, and this workbook, and whether this is um, the right level of information, if there's other information this doesn't provide, if this is you know, confusing. Um, we're really looking for feedback on the process, but also this tool. Um, in, in terms of does it meet the, the needs for information that you all have. Okay, yes. If you've already answered this, um, I'll get an answer later. But um, on the chart before, uh, FY21 and 22 have um, debt exclusion in there. Mm -hmm. Did you talk about that? Um, I can. Uh, 
Oh, right here. Yep. So, um, so some of these things are just assumptions for right now for planning purposes, um, or, or basically the information, sort of our most recent uh, estimates. So this is the new building section. This is a good example of one of the areas where we're trying to decide whether new buildings belong here or not, because it, it sort of skews the, the numbers when you have these new buildings in here. Um, or maybe that should be a separate section. But so these are all the building projects we discussed. Right now, um, the school we have highlighted as a possible debt exclusion, and the library we have highlighted as a possible debt exclusion. Um, I think Ms. Shane mentioned earlier about um, Jones Library. So we went back and forth on how to uh, display this. Originally, it had 21 million in there. I brought it back down to 15.9 for what was projected to be the town share. But then came back to that, I think eventually the town's going to have to authorize the full amount, um, which includes the extra $6 million, which would be reduced by fundraising. So that's a number that we have to discuss going forward. Um, and it's highlight, the $6 million is highlighted as a possible debt exclusion, but if the fundraising uh, hits its goal, that portion would come off. Um, uh, I think fundraising and the, the historic tax credits um, are, are part of that number. Just so people understand I mean that's when you go back on the very first page there's a, a really big jump in proposed debt yeah. so the proposed debt that we are paying for out of the flow is on that line right the and debt exclusion is being paid by an increase to taxpayers right the, know, the, so it yeah otherwise it would look a lot worse, worse. right yeah the, the orange ones are not factored into the projected debt the the other ones are So, and I guess, you know, I mean, there, there's some general comments that were offered about the nature and the con construct of the 10-year plan. Um, just in the, first of all, to remind everyone that the charter actually only requires that there be a five-year projections. Um, the JCPC had been, um, in the last couple of years, moving it to 10 years, and uh, we uh, basically concluded that uh, that's still consistent with the charter to go to the longer period. The, um, it's a thought document. It is to help us visualize what we see from the JCPC side as all of the needs and how they might be spaced, but um, it's always been um, understood that uh, the numbers um, are uh, pretty vague at that point. They really haven't been refined. And uh, the, the decision and the priorities is going to vary as we get closer in time and really see where the highest needs are, but that it's helpful to get it all out there so that we l at least have some concept of what the needs are and how they might be spaced. Um, the critical decisions always come when it gets around to the year in, at hand, and we actually are at JCPC level having to make recommendations for the year itself, the expenditures you're going for, or bonding um, to get them into a specific place. But, uh, there is a little bit of that um, pushing out that has always happened. And uh, there was actually, I, I can recall back to a time where there was the, the last column was something like uh, future without even putting a date in. Mm -hmm. And it was just a way of making sure that things got listed. But uh, we, when we moved to 10 years, we could do away with that. Mm -hmm. So, I guess at this point, um, see if there are other questions about the whole JCPC report. If not, um, when we come back um, as a finance committee, we will need to uh, make our final recommendation as to whether we are recommending as the uh, manager requests the specific expenditures
for FY20, and then that has, that will become a part of the budget recommendation to the council. So, anything else? Any and I don't any public comment on the uh, hmm. capital plan. There's not public left, but. Yes, there is. There's I know. I said not much public yeah, left, public. but there is. Yes, um, it's all available under the, um, the the whole JCPC report is available with the budget, other budget documents. So. Um, is, adjourn. I think yeah, the council probably can adjourn and the finance committee. Uh, I don't think we have any minutes to take care of. We don't because you didn't yeah. come get my minutes back to me yet. Okay. But do and shelney has got a dread. There, there's two sets of minutes and then there's one question. I have to three. Uh, three and Dorothy. We have three sets of minutes, but to my That's knowledge, I have only one of them. Right. Do I hear a motion to adjourn the town council meeting? I move. Second. Second. And Mandy Joe is a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 I'm sorry, I'm supposed to also ask you to say aye. 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 <laughs> Opposed? <laughs> Stain. Declared as unanimous. Sure. It's unanimous. Uh, and we're, uh, the finance committee is probably going to be uh, following in about 60 seconds. Uh, because I don't think that, Sonia, that there's any budget updates at this point. There's no, no news from Beacon Hill that caused us to change anything. No. Cherry sheets remain the same. We're meeting at 1 on the 20th of Yep. Yeah. Um, so uh, with that, I think uh, I know other business. and. Uh, I assume there's a, is there a motion to adjourn the finance committee? I will, I'm a move. I yeah. second. Okay, all in favor from the finance wow. committee, it's unanimous. So we are, the finance committee is also adjourned. Gosh.